Let's get this over with. WCW Monday Nitro, number 169, December 7th, 1998. <laughs> it's always good when you sit down and watch a three-hour television show, and the first thing the host says is, folks, this has already been a draining day. <laughs> I I cannot, I never, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm gonna, I can't wait till Russo shows up mm. for two reasons. Number one, it's going to get even worse. So, like, there's going to be a level of badness where it's entertaining again. And number two, that's when it switches to two hours. That's all, the best This three-hour Nitro is such a drain on my existence. Well, you bring up, a point, bring up a point there, and you're wondering how, at times, the horrible product of Raw was winning. Raw was a spe- spectacular train wreck. Mm-hmm. This Nitro was just boring. It was rarely bad enough to make fun of. It was just a long, boring, pointless show. There was more stupid stuff on Raw. Yes. Quite frankly. But, I mean... <sighs> I'm just going to jump to the end here really quick. I mean, seriously. <laughs> we just do this show backwards for fun. <laughs> seriously. They got 30,000 tickets sold. And they advertise a main event of Goldberg versus Bam Bam Bigelow. That would have been awesome. For three hours. Kevin Nash comes out here. He adds himself to the match. Whatever you think of that, it doesn't matter. There's a third star in the match. They went like 40 seconds. Uh-huh. I mean, come on. So whenever I hear everybody make all the excuses for why WCW died, AOL Time Warner, this, that, the other thing. No, it fucking sucked. That's why it died. Because it fucking sucked. Because it deserved to. Let's go on. So the draining day is that apparently there's why this drained the entire company, I don't know. But they've announced Goldberg versus Bam Bam Bigelow in a non-title match for the main event tonight. To which Shivani says... Keep that in mind, by the way. A non-title match. Well, yes. Why? Well, it was explained last week when they signed the contract. This is a very important detail. Goldberg will not be defending his title until, until his match with Kevin Nash. At Starcade, yes. So when he faces Bigelow tonight, it's non-title. Right? Right. Okay. Right. Shivani says it's non title and then says, This is one of the biggest main events we've ever had. <laughs> so, right before the show went on the air, Scott Steiner killed Wildcat Willie. One of the best things on the show. <laughs> they showed clips of it. Scott Steiner should meet up mascots every week. And I mean in 2017. The best part about it was he's killing Wildcat Willie, and Shivani said something about, You know, this Wildcat Willie's a really nice guy. I'm sure he is. That's how he got sympathy. He's actually a nice guy. Playing a cat. It's very mean for Scott Steiner to beat his ass. <laughs> He's a mascot. Why Why would he need sympathy? Because otherwise, why is Scott Steiner beating up fucking Wildcat Willie? Why should we care? Because he's a jerk. No, funny. he's a nice guy. No. No, Steiner. Oh, yeah. Of course, we know that. I laughed. That's all I care. That's all I know about. That's all I know and all I care about. Speaking of Scott Steiner, they reca- recapped all the nonsense with his heel ref on Nitro and Thunder. Would you like to recap it, Vinny? I'll do it for you. It's also a very important detail. Steiner's out of his mind. He's killing people, including executives. And mascots. He's a madman. Therefore, the referees were all afraid of Scott Steiner. Mm-hmm. So he decided, I'll just get my own referee. Am I missing any part of this puzzle? No. Okay. Go ahead. So Scott is a madman. He says some very offensive things. Forgive me, everyone, but he says the only things from Texas are steers and queers. It's not true, by the way. Thank you, Craig. There's (laughs) other things. They have cacti. Are you telling me Scott Steiner's a liar? Yes. He bends the truth a bit, yes. So he runs down Texas men for a while, asks for an ovation for, for Hollywood Hogan, which... At first, I was sure he said Halloween Hogan, which would be a better gimmick, honestly. Told them all to bow to him. The luchador in red and yellow? Yeah, sure. (laughs) I think he challenged Scott Hall tonight. I really wasn't sure. He did. He rambled around. This was not a very good promo. Nitro party clips. Got two things to say. New rule. Fat guys in t-shirts and shorts don't get to cut Ric Flair promos. Just don't. However, this party did have their own Nitro girls. Therefore, it's a thumbs up Nitro party. And on that note, they came back. The Nitro girls had already danced once. Now they danced a second time. Yeah, there wasn't a match in the ring until... Uh, you gotta get your money's worth. 16 minutes into the show was the first match. Right. Because... But that's without commercials on the network. Also true. Also true. 
Because after the Nitro Girls have danced twice, now it's time for a Tigress video package. Can you imagine they put this on the air? <laughs> and it went two and a half minutes. Seemed longer. She's talking about her love of dance. They've got her dance teacher on there. She used to be an accountant. She works for Lisa Lopez. She's a full-time dancer. She's Puerto Rican. She has a choreographer. She likes making people smile. What in the hell were they thinking? She used to work for Lisa Lopez. By well, the time she did. Yeah. yeah. Not anymore. No, Thanks, she, Craig. She's gone. <laughs> we're watching an old show. Just now so I, you know. No, I, one of them's dead. That's why. Well. <laughs> <laughs> While Craig does whatever Craig is doing, I must apologize. I, I skipped over a match. Kendall Wyndham versus DDP. Yeah, I, where are you? I, I, skipped, I skipped this match. God forbid. <laughs> what a tragedy that I did not talk about this match. In all seriousness, this match began 60 minutes into the show. It ended 18 minutes into the show. Page one with the diamond cutter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he tried to idiot-proof this match with Kendall Wyndham. It was all right. And I've said this before, but every time I see it, his diamond cutter setups are so antiquated. After oh. seeing Randy Orton hit guys from virtually every conceivable position, doing every conceivable spot. Almost out of nowhere. But man, the place just goes nuts for it. The whole spot was, I'll whip you to the corner and hit you on the way out. And the announcer's like, my God, a brand new setup for the diamond cutter. They yeah. couldn't believe their eyes. Randy Orton is in fact smoother and more graceful than DDP. Yeah, it's not just that, it's just, it's more modern. It, it, has all, it also has all been done before. That is true. Then we have the Tigers video package. Recaps of the Goldberg Nash Bigelow angle from last week. And then it's Norman Smiley versus Prince Iakea. The second match begins 25 minutes into the show, plus commercials. Way to go, head up versus Raw. Prince Iakea versus Norman Smiley. Yeah. Bad match, yes. Smiley wins. Who gives a fuck? Norman's out there in his small trunks and no knee pads doing all kinds of pelvic thrusting. My wife saw his dance and went, ew. Well, better than next time, Norman. I guess. Every everybody who is in wrestling in like a management position should just watch all of these shows. Why are we the only ones doing this? Everybody should be doing this. There's so much to learn from this. I mean, they're patently obvious, but... So Norman kicks out of a top rope splash for whatever reason. This second match on Nitro needs WrestleMania near falls. And then he goes for a cross-face chicken wing, and he can't get it, 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 and then Iakea just submits to nothing. Well, Tony said he cranked his neck. Do you know what he actually did? It, it was actually very close to that hold Jinder uses that I like to make fun of. I think Jinder was actually more involved. Because at least he has a half Nelson. Well, you know, Norman Smiley works for WWE now, so it's very likely he gave that hold Maybe to Jinder Maybe I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. This was a terrible mm. match. Although I did like, at the very end, Norman is doing his lewd dance in the middle of the ring, and just over his shoulder there's a sign in big letters reading, Feel the Wang. Hmm. Yeah, I saw that sign. Time travel. Eddie Guerrero on Thunder chewed out Rey Mysterio and said, Hoovy is the person in the LWO who are getting cruiserweight title shots and then Shivani who was there to interview with him towering over all of them says actually Eddie WCW has booked Ray versus Hoobie in a top contenders match so Eddie throws a tantrum we're back on Nitro Jane brings Eddie out for a promo Eddie says Ray is selfish and needs to be disciplined he brings out Silver King and they spoke in Spanish for a bit and they left together Silver King he's cutting this promo and he sounds exactly like Dr. Wagner Jr. Which he should, because he's his brother. <laughs> Funny how that works. But it was just mind-blowing to me. I was like, he sounds exactly like Wagner. <laughs> like, if I didn't know better, I'd think they were related. Uh -huh. I can't say anything. I'm the person who once pointed out Big Papa Pump sounds like Scott Steiner. I did say that. So hmm. we got Silver King versus Rey Mysterio Jr. Finally, the show turned around. This match was awesome. They had a couple of sloppy spots where, like, Ray came off the top of the diving hurricane run and Silver King just forgot what was going on. You know what, though? Like, I could I could tell they fucked it up, but the fact that Ray flew through the air, collided with this guy, and just went splat on the mat, I think that was cooler than if they'd done it right. Sure, plus... It was great. Plus, they didn't go back to it. No? Silver King just looked at him like he meant to do it, mm -hmm. and they kept going. Yes. These two guys were so... This match was only, like, three minutes long. I know. But it felt longer and better. And That's weird, rare. And a really anticlimactic finish, to be honest with you. They were up on the top, and Ray had a top rope fame asser and pinned him. 
I think it was anticlimactic because you didn't expect a top rope fame asser to be the finish. Correct. But if you go into it expecting that, you know, if you get here with a top rope fame asser, actually I actually think it was a bulldog. It was a bulldog. But anyway. My mistake. Yeah. It was a it great could have finish. Been either or, though, the way it was done. He jumped off and he fell on his face and he pinned him. Yeah. It's fine. I liked it. it I loved it. Excellent, excellent wrestling match. I adored it. Goldberg arrived at the building, shirt tucked into his jeans, carrying the world title belt in his hand and no bag. Nash blocked his path and protested. He says there's going to be no match with Big O tonight, and they all rant and rave at each other and whatever. <laughs> Wrath versus Renegade. Oh, this. Well, first Disco comes out. And he calls out Conan. No, that's next. We can talk about it now, if you want to. Was it really at before? I had it written down first. I don't know how. Well, anyway, he calls him out. I no longer care, so go ahead. He says, Conan, why don't you tell everybody the big news? Conan's like, well, I don't know what the news is, and if you don't tell me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dump you on your head or something. Because, you know, Conan does a lot of suplexes. Disco says, Kevin Nash put me in the wolf pack. Conan's baffled. So was I. Disco says, we'll talk about it later. And off he goes. That's it. And then we did, in fact, have Wrath versus Renegade. So let me tell you the good news and the bad news, okay? The bad news is, this went way too fucking long. It was only like three minutes. But it's Wrath and the Renegade. Mm -hmm. The good news is, WCW, as fucking stupid as they were, they are still smarter than WWE because if this match had been on Raw this past Monday, Renegade would have taken two-thirds of this match before <laughs> Wrath would have beaten him. That's true. <laughs> There's some long matches on Raw this week. Yeah, that's true. Not just that, but Bo Dallas and Finn Balor and Bo Dallas took t three of the four minutes of the match and Asuka and Alicia Fox and Alicia Fox took 90% of the match. These fuckers even knew what to do. You know what's a bad look is when you put fringe on the back of your tights, your little tiny trunks, making it look like a tutu. What's wrong with that? That's what the renegade was wearing tonight. Well, maybe he was wearing a tutu. Maybe he, he's now a dancer. Uh, okay. Wrath won, everybody. Yeah. It was ugly. It was. The match and the gear. So then we have the disco thing, and the disco says, I got a match. We'll talk about this later. Oh, this match. What? Diabolical mad genius put this together. Disco Inferno and Chavo Guerrero with the horse against Horace and Stevie Ray. 30,000 tickets, baby. And then they just had like a long wrestling match. And they went back and forth and they had heat. For a while, it was just a boring tag match. There was a heat on Disco. Chavo makes his comeback and it's not very good, but it's not like offensively bad. And then it's time for the four-way, and all four men on, and the ref were on five different pages of five different books in five different languages. This four-way just went forever as guys tried to get in position for stuff, over and over and over again. And the payoff is just, the NWO hits a stuffed pile driver and pins Disco. That was it. That was it. The highlight of the match was when Larry Zabisco called Stevie Ray, and I quote, a big, mean guy. Well, you know, he is a big, mean guy. It's accurate. He really is. It was accurate. Nash comes out for a promo. What was this brown shirt that he was <laughs> Thank wearing? Thank you. I, I mean, not... <laughs> I don't usually bother talking about what people are wearing. Sure. I often don't notice. It certainly is not a talking point. This. This was a uh, brown velour button-up with it's, long sleeves. It's and... not just what it was, although that's a very fair question. Kevin Nash is enormous. Where did he find this oversized brown <laughs> velvet or velour or whatever the hell it was button-up shirt? The big and tall pimp shop. <laughs> I'm guessing. I mean, no normal-sized guys wearing this fucking no, thing. No, this was a shirt for a 10-foot man. So he puts himself in the three-way. No, let me get into this, because I, I talked about it earlier. He comes out here, he's mad. Mm -hmm. He says, Goldberg signed for one match and one match only, and it's versus me. I, he says... I am not allowing this match to take place here tonight. So first off, this guy's a baby face. Sure. Am I missing something I here? I have no idea what he is. He's Kevin Nash. Second, what the fuck's he worried about? It's a non-title match. Your belt is not at stake here. It doesn't matter what happens in this match. You still get your match at Starcade. Mm -hmm. 
I can only assume, and this is not explained, I'm connecting many dots that are very far apart. He is worried Bam Bam Bigelow will cripple Goldberg, and then the title match will be off. Oh, well, you know what might have been helpful if you would have said that. Or the announcers. Instead, all five he of them comes out. Gene. He tells the fans they're not going to get the match they want to see. They boo the guy out of the building. <laughs> and so then he says, well, fine, I'll be in the match. Which, by the way, which, by the way, ah, forget it. I'll talk about it later. Mm. Well, I just want to think it's funny. He's, his exact words were, Big Sexy's making it a three-way dance. Yeah, three-way dance. So in storyline now, he has booking power? Well, yeah. Well, no, 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 no. We'll get to that. Okay. Glacier versus Saturn. I told you this was coming up last week. I said this is going to happen, and it did. Speaking of fashion, I think the cat may have been wearing the Vinny V jumpsuit. Not certain. Something, That's true. It's I, very close I, to it. It's very close. So he explains he had hurt his ankle stepping out of his 1975 Cadillac so he could not fight Saturn tonight. And then Glacier kicks Saturn and the bell rings and the promo continues and I had no idea what was going on. Saturn makes a comeback. Tony explained. He's talking about the main event, the three-way dance. He says, nothing less than a nitro explosion is coming tonight. Oh. Huh. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> So, Saturn makes a comeback. There's 30,000 people there. Maybe 300 cared. Cat tries to hit, hit... He tries to kick Saturn. Saturn ducks. Cat hits Glacier. The ref sees Cat hit Glacier, calls to the bell, and rewards the match to Glacier via DQ. None of the announcers could figure out why <laughs> Glacier won. It was simple. Including today. Yeah. They're absolutely baffled. They, they were so baffled. That I rewound it because I <laughs> thought make sure. maybe maybe it's my mistake. Yes. Maybe it's not as clear cut as I thought it was. Nope. Shat hit Glacier. Therefore, Glacier won via DQ. Mm -hmm. What is so hard to figure out about this? I don't know. They went on and on about bad refereeing. And then, listen to me, everybody. Go watch Saturn give Scott Dickinson the Death Valley Driver. It's the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. So, imagine Saturn kicks you in the gut and he's going to give you the Death Valley Driver. Mm -hmm. How would you react, everybody? Just make something up. Surprised. You, Vinny, you, the listeners, anybody. What would you do, Vinny? I'd grab my stomach. Okay, what do you do, Craig? I would act surprised, like, what is this madman doing? Okay, then he hoists you up. What do you do, Vinny? I scream. What do you do, Craig? Uh, exactly. Exactly. This fucking Scott Dickinson, I swear to God. You watched this much more closely than I did. Dude, he stands there. Saturn kicks him. He doesn't move. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't change his facial expression. He doesn't do anything. Saturn hoists him up onto his shoulders. He doesn't move. He doesn't kick. He doesn't frown. He doesn't smile. He doesn't do anything. Saturn flips him over, and he lands flat on his back and doesn't move a muscle ever again. Crippled. It is seriously the funniest attack I have ever seen in the history of pro wrestling. Vinny, Craig, listeners, <laughs> what do they call it when you make the thing? Animated GIF? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm begging you. Make the animated GIF. I need, I need this for my avatar on the board. You know? What do you call it when you make the thing? I laughed so hard. I watched it over and over and over and over and over again. It literally was like, as soon as Saturn looked at him, he just died. And so Saturn booted him and then lifted him up and then gave him the move. He was a statue. This was the highlight of Nitro. Apparently. I should find it play right here. Lex Luger versus Emery Hale in his Nitro Ooh. debut. Emery Hale was a guy who was around WCW forever. He was brought in by Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart. He's like six foot nine. That's why they brought him in. Yeah. He's, he's big and thick, and they thought maybe someday we'll be able to groom this guy into something we can make some money with. So that's who he was. And he's in there with Lex. And uh, the, the, the end of the story is, uh, sadly, he had a kidney transplant in 2003 and passed away in 2006. That's, that sucks. That does suck. So, he's in there with Lex. Lex gave him a lot. He's getting, it's a, a lot? He took the whole match. <laughs> I guess, I, apparently, Emery Hale was Bo Dallas, and Lex was Finn Balor. <laughs> uh, so, eventually, 
for some reason, I know he's, he's clearly an athletic guy, but he kept going to the top rope, which is a bad form for a giant. And if he missed a top rope splash, Lex and his goatee made a comeback, and one with a torture rack, and everyone went, went crazy. This was a win, when all was said and done. One of the better things on the show. Had a Nash Goldberg video package. It's 30 seconds long. It's fine for what it was. Chris Jericho comes out for a promo, says he hates cowboys. You know that his first gimmick was supposed to be Cowboy Chris Jericho? I think he mentioned that last week. Something about Stu Hart yep. trying to make... Yeah. So he's, 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 he's hated Cowboys ever since. I think it was Bulldog Bob Brown was going to give him that moniker. Hmm. So Ralph, this guy was amazing. So amazing that there were fans in the crowd dressed like Ralphus. Half shirt, bellies. Bellies. Lots of bellies. Well, it's a part of the costume. It's true. You couldn't have a lean, ripped Ralphus and destroy the joke. So they had like five minutes, had a perfectly fine little match, and Duncan tries a power bomb. Jericho turns into a cradle, puts his feet on the ropes for the win. I guess this feud's over now. You know what's amazing about it is there's one guy that can get a good match out of Bobby Duncan Jr. And it's Chris Jericho. Yeah. He's done it twice. What is amazing about it is I have, I always look at these matches from a wrestler's perspective. I'm like, if I do, who, what would I do if I had to wrestle Bobby Duncan Jr.? I would idiot-proof this match. Jericho did not do that. Jericho did some things in this match that in a thousand years I wouldn't have tried with Bobby Duncan, including the finish where Duncan goes for the power bomb. Jericho flips over him, which, by the way, almost breaks Duncan's neck because his own head gets in the way. But he pulls it off and gets his feet on the ropes and pins him. I was amazed by this match. This match was amazing. Speaking of amazing, Giant is still on Nitro. Now, spoiler alert, everyone. I know for a fact Giant is in WWF in like two months. So he, he didn't have a no-compete deal at all. He is leaving, and they're having him squash guys. <laughs> now, granted, Putski should not have beaten the Giant, but like... Giant should have been out there doing jobs for everybody on the way out. Mm-hmm. They're so stupid. Mm-hmm. James Ellsworth got cut and had to wait three months before going on TV again. Yeah, WCW didn't do those things. <laughs> Jesus. Hey, look, like right after Bret Hart's contract expired, he was on Nitro. That's they didn't true. have those. I guess then. that's true. I guess that's true. So, well, <laughs> when, did Bret's, when, did, when did Bret's contract expire? Was it not like... It was, it was like December... No. December 12th or something like I that? I see. Never mind. Yeah. Oh, right. It was not the day after Survivor Series. Yeah. Honestly, I just assumed it was. <laughs> no. But, that's why the whole thing is so stupid. Well, no. I, I, yeah, because he could have done... He could have dropped the belt later. Yeah. Regardless, Giant missed one choke slam, hit another one, one. And he cut a promo calling Paige Leatherface. Said Paige had his attention. Challenged Paige to a match at Starcade. Then he said, I don't make any of this up. Paige, you think you do all the banging in WCW? You're not the bang man. You've never even seen a bang. Anyway, he wants a match with Paige at Starcade. <laughs> Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko versus Raven and Canyon. First, we had a segment backstage where oh, geez. Conan is threatening to tape up Scott Steiner's oh, ref. Yes, I didn't even write this down. It's creepy, but we'll get to it. Yeah. So Raven still won't come out. Canyon's <laughs> chewing him out. Canyon says... Raven, come on. We're going to get in trouble. Yeah. That was his exact words. We're going to get in trouble. Yeah. To which Raven responds, you're such a geek, Canyon. <laughs> that did happen. I should have written that down. That did happen. He's, he's telling the truth. <laughs> he's not wrong. So Canyon says Raven's old friends with Saturn and Roddy Piper broke him into the business and all. What? Okay, whatever. Then he comes out and says, Raven won't come out here, so it's not going to be a tag match tonight, but I will face either you, Dean Malenko, or you, Chris Benoit, on Thunder. Can I ask a question as a fan? Mm -hmm. Where in the fuck is this Raven thing going? They're paying this guy six figures (laughs) for this fucking stupid storyline. And he doesn't have to work. Is this where Sandman comes in? I have, I never, I could look it up, I don't care enough. Hack? Yes, hardcore hack. I'm just baffled. I mean, the Spring Stampede the ne- is the next year, and he's there. He's there then, so it's got to be sometime right. fairly soon. I don't know. It's, a, it's an educated guess, but I don't know. So anyway, Canyon shoves Arn. Arn pulls out a crowbar. The horseman beat Canyon up. He runs away. Remember, everyone. Arn Anderson keeps a crowbar in his trousers. <laughs> Who doesn't? Where else would you keep it? That's a good point, actually. 
Had an Eric Bischoff, Ric Flair video package. Brian, I don't want to see your... What's happening? I don't want to see your chrome. Oh ah. At least not again. Talk hey, about this Flair promo. Christmas is coming, and what I'm getting for you, Brian, is... Excuse me? So, what? <laughs> I'm <laughs> Christmas. I'm getting an opaque you desk. You want an early Christmas? I'm, gonna, I'm going to get an opaque desk, so I have to see you unzip your fly over and over again. I can, you, the desk is glass. Oh, yeah. I yeah. thought you were talking about that one right there. Oh! I was like, it's already opaque, you idiot. All right. This Flair promo was... Flair's awesome. Yeah, this was a great promo, getting back on track. It was funny, because Dean and Benoit and Orange just stayed out there. And Mongo and Flair come out, and they're very calm and subdued and rational. <laughs> and Flair shakes hands and hugs all his friends, including Mongo, who came out with him. But he just lets them all know that he loves them. And then he just grabs the mic, and he snaps. <laughs> the switch gets flipped. Tells Bischoff, get off your girlfriend or your treadmill. Listen up. Your dictatorship is about to come to an end. And they're in Houston. He starts listing all of the legends of Houston wrestling. So they all gave their blood and sweat to give you, you jack off the job you have. As soon as he says jack off, I don't know who it was, but it sounded like one of the announcers just took off their headset and threw it. <laughs> Here's what he's going to do at Starcade to Bischoff. I, I, I wrote it all down too. You did as well? Yes. He's going to choke him. Check. Gouge his eyes. Check. Kick him in the you know where. Check. Chop him. Check. Squeeze that skinny neck. Check. Until the blood runs down your nostrils Check. and your eyes pop out. Check. This is the greatest promo I've ever heard. And finally, you'll say that you respect Ric Flair. You're gonna Me take. Meanwhile, his eyes are bugging out, and he's turning four shades of red. <laughs> and blood is going to pop out of anywhere at any point. So he's gonna take Bischoff's job, his life, his paycheck, and his dignity. Well, actually, the exact. <laughs> this is exactly what he said. Girlfriend too. He's gonna take his paycheck. Girlfriend. This was the order: your paycheck, your job, your life, and your dignity. Yes. Pretty much ends with the life, <laughs> well, I think. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much, yeah. So they're going to take back the greatest sport in the world, professional wrestling. This was so great. It was wonderful. He's the best promo of all time. It's, it's not even close. It's true. He was a good talker. He is a good talker. He's a, he should be a motivational speaker. <laughs> I was ready to charge hell with a squirt gun with him. Have you seen his rap video? No. There's a rapper. Ric Flair? Yeah, it's 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 new, right? It's new. I haven't I haven't bothered watching it, but I know about it. I, I think the guy just sampled the woo, so he brought in Flair just to to be Ric Flair next to him as he raps into the camera. <laughs> Sounds awesome. It is great. Booker T versus Conan, not great. No, no, slow and boring. Stevie Ray walks out. Booker T goes up top, but Stevie hits the <sighs> ring, lays out Conan with a slapjack for the DQ. He just. Walked in the ring, hit Conan with it, and was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> Booker's all mad. Stevie says, go ahead and hit me. And Booker says, that was my TV title. Stevie says, you need to be with me in the NWO. That's what's important. Did one of the 30,000 people care? I sure did. It's impossible. I hated it. And they were in Houston. Scott Hall came out for a promo that he was, stu he was too stupid to quit wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> well so we had Scott Hall versus Scott Steiner was it not Scott Dickinson that took that DVD from Saturn I, I don't remember I could have sworn it was and he came out here mm. do you know why Scott Dickinson that was, came out that was Jimmy or uh, Corderas that's in WWF no 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 um, Hart crap Go Carter ahead. so here's the whole key to this match Steiner and Hall are brawling in the ring. And out hops Slick Johnson, taped up like a mummy. Right. Now, now this here's... company is so fucking stupid, they can't even remember their own storylines. He hops out, and Scott Dickinson runs down and shoves him out of the way and runs to the ring to referee the match. They're now pretending that... Steiner has hired this referee to screw all of the baby faces. They don't even remember that the whole reason he's there is because the WCW referees won't referee Steiner's matches. And now they tape the guy up so he can't interfere, and a WCW ref comes out and shoves him out of the way and rushes to the ring to officiate. Okay, okay. Yeah. Is funny. this that hard? What was also preposterous is Conan went back there to quote unquote tape him up. 
he tapes him up and tapes up his mouth and everything, but then left enough room for the whistle. That's the least of my problems here. <laughs> That's so stupid. Why would you do that? Dude, how about the whole storyline was stupid? That's bigger than a damn whistle. Anyway. They had a big brawl. It was stupid. Right, Fans loved try, it. I'm going to try and play devil's advocate here. Uh, please. The, please. Fa- the referees are afraid of Scott Steiner. Yes. Scott Steiner says, okay, I will hire my own ref. He will screw my, all my opponents, yes. all my matches. Mm-hmm. So Scott Dickinson, or whoever this ref, say, ref is, says, you know what? It's time to take a stand. And I shall put my life into my own hands for the good of the company. And we will screw this ref, and we'll go screw Scott Steiner and try to get a fair match out of this. Well, we could add on top of everything else that it wasn't a match. And in the end, it was not a match. <laughs> so what the hell was going on here? Well, it was going to be a match, wasn't it? Yeah, and they, 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 it was DQ. supposed to be a match. Yeah. The NWO ran in an attack hall. Luger and Conan and Giant run out, and Paige hits the ring with a chair. Now, this is the kind of thing, it sounds awful. There's 7,000 things going on at once. It all leads to nothing. It's all the same brawl you've ever seen. This crowd did not love everything on the show, but they loved this anarchy and chaos. Hey, they loved it. And then DDP ran down, laid out Giant with a chair that sets up their match at Starcade. I mean, it wasn't a total disaster, but this referee bullshit was just infuriating. It's my pet peeve. Always has been. Referee bullshit. Me and Gene brings Bret Hart out for a promo. The three best things in the show, mm-hmm. Rey Mysterio, Ric Flair, and Bret Hart. Yeah, but this was kind of disappointing. I don't think so. He only had one funny line when he said the fans were throwing things at Gene. Oh, no, that wasn't even his best line. His best line is when he says, Dallas Page, you can fight me for the title, or you can fight the giant. You're probably better off taking the coward's way out and fighting the giant than fighting me. (laughs) So now he's got no match, so instead of having a match, he hypes up himself. What a great accomplishment this was, winning winning back the U.S. title. This proves how excellent I am. And then Garbage hits the ring, and Gene says, or Brett says, these people are throwing garbage at you, Gene. And he wraps up, and he's done, and Gene says, oh, by the way, Brett's in a documentary called Wrestling with Shadows. You should go watch it. <laughs> okay. After thought. Yeah. You know, when he came out and there were like nine minutes left on the show. Yeah. I mean, I knew what was going to happen in the main event, but it was still like, are you kidding me? Well, let me tell you the worst part about it. Michael Buffer starts the ring intros to the main event, and then my computer just won't play Nitro anymore. Oh, No. <laughs> The last two minutes of this show seriously took me more than ten minutes to watch. And there were only two minutes left in the show. Did like, you Gosh. did you at least get to hear how Michael Buffer described Bam Bam Bigelow? I heard him pronounce his name Bam Bam Bigelow. Bam Bam runs down to the ring in just a sweatpants shirt with no sleeves. Not even flames on it. And a in a just a guy pair of sweatpants. Yeah. And Buffer describes him as, and I quote a man who has literally bullied his way from paid admission to ring center for tonight's main event. He's not wrong. That's what who happened. writes this shit for Michael him? Buffer. Yeah. That's impossible. They said he'd been granted a license for one match only tonight. So, Bam Bam gets a full intro, and Kevin Nash runs faster than you've ever seen Kevin Nash run before in your life. They're running out of time. I guess so. He runs down and starts brawling with Bam Bam. Goldberg starts running out, although he does take the time to high-five Roger Clemens backstage. That made me laugh. Well, <laughs> I would have done the same thing. <laughs> and then he runs in the ring. As soon as Goldberg hits the ring, the bell rings. I don't know if it was to start of the match or in the match. I don't know what's going well, on. Well, it was to end the match. The ref's waving it off. So, Here's what I concluded. Okay. When Kevin Nash came out and added himself to this match, right. he was just making up shit. Sure. The match was still Goldberg versus Bam Bam Bigelow. So as soon as both men were in the ring and Nash was in the ring, it was a DQ. Okay. Yeah. That's the way I saw it as well. This is so stupid. <laughs> that's really stupid. So that was it. That was the end of the show. They, they brawled for 30 seconds and Geek separated them and that was it. I was really looking forward to Bam Bam and Goldberg. Yeah. Well, one of these days you'll get it. So here we go. Finisher report. Oh, this should be good. Actually, it's, it, it's amazing the swing that happens on this show. You really need theme music for this, by the way. I'll get some someday. Okay. Clean pin. Submission to a hold that was not on. Clean pin. Clean pin. Clean pin. Should I start over now? Yes. Okay. From the beginning. The finishers on this episode of Nitro. A clean pin. A submission to a hold that was not locked on. Three clean pins in a row. And I thought, wow. 
show's amazing. Maybe they figured it out. And then, DQ because Cat kicked the wrong guy. A clean submission. Pin with the feet on the ropes. A clean pin. And the final three. DQ due to Slapjack. DQ due to Gang Attack. Some kind of DQ in that three-way main event. Huh. There we go. It sucked. WCW Monday Nitro number 170, December 14th, 1998. Let me reiterate. Do not go back and watch this show. You will regret it. Unless you need to sleep. No, not even that. And, and if you are fighting insomnia, go ahead and watch this. It'll put you right to sleep. Hey, Craig, if you're fighting insomnia, there's like a thousand things I'd watch before this. This sucked. What if you can't go to sleep? Then you're stuck watching it. Yeah, you've got insomnia, <laughs> and you're going to watch this? I see. God, this show is bad. Let's start with the first shitty thing, which was the opening segment. Scott Putsky versus Raven. Raven comes out. He's supposed to be, like, on strike or whatever because he's sad. Sure. So he's in street clothes, which is jeans, a t-shirt, and a leather jacket. That's what he wrestles in anyway. The only thing missing from this and his gear is longer sleeves on his pants. This is, he's wearing pants, uh, yeah. jean pants instead of jean shorts. I didn't even know he was on strike. I thought this was just what he did every week. Or whatever. Did I not ask last week if this was leading anywhere? Apparently not. He's just a whiny yes, Craig, so baby. He, so he's he sits in the corner and whines, talks about his welcoming Khmer, is what he said, the cold, hard sting of latex. Actual words said by Raven on national television. It was so... Bad. He it says, was it was a Bray Wyatt promo. What was this he, was. What yeah. was he getting at with the cold hard sting of latex? Don't know. Don't care. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> it sucked. Maybe just BDSM is his thing. I don't know. That's entirely possible given the crew he's hung out with and the way they dressed the past year. So Canyon comes out, says, Putsky, this is none of your business. Leave. Putsky and he left. Leaves. Geek of the Jeez, week. He was such a fucking geek. So and like He's there, and the ref's there, and they're talking to each other. And apparently their discussion was, should we leave? And quite frankly, even though he was the Geek of the Week, like, I mean, he was a geek for coming out in the first place. You were booked against Raven, and you thought you were going to have a match. That's why you're the Geek of the Week. You came down to the ring. What a putz. You've been saving that for days, haven't Years. you? Years. <laughs> like, this was the first time you could use it, by the way. <laughs> so he had every opportunity he's Shut ever up. been in the ring. So, Canyon tears into Raven. You get more airtime than anyone else without ever wrestling. True. Everyone is sick of it. Also true. And then he starts to spout some bullshit. <laughs> Raven's got a pre-med degree. He went to an Ivy League school. He's got a $3.2 million trust fund. He has to put the decimal point in there. Can't just say more than $3 million. No. Has to get it down, down to the hundred grand. You bought you a Mercedes and you were 16. Raven says, my mom doesn't love me. Fuck you both. I don't want to know. I don't know where the segment is going. I don't care. I am tired of the Raven Kane storyline. And then here's the payoff. They left. Yep, just walked away. <laughs> Fuck this. I mean, it, it did suck, but I was glad when they just left. That's true. I, I At least was, it was over. I was not hoping they'd be there longer. <laughs> Viano five versus Eddie Guerrero. Now it, this was fun. This was like the highlight until the end of the whole show. It's one of them. There was just something about it, though. I don't want to say anything negative about this match, but man. It was pointless. This is the opener. It's a long match with Aviano. There's a bunch of rest holds. I mean, for fuck's sake, do Eddie Guerrero and Viano 5 need a bunch of rest holds? I'm so sick of rest holds in cruiserweight matches. And then... So Eddie's random, mysterious, unnamed bodyguard, who was still random, mysterious, and unnamed. And it's funny, because Tony almost stooged off what his name was did he these five weeks later because i was like what is that guy's name tony almost said it and then he got sidetracked and never said the guy's name well we still don't know he crotched uh viano on the top rope after shushing the crowd not to not to stooge him off eddie had a superplex in the frog splash but he did not pin the man he called for the lwo and suddenly the bell rang it's almost like they know that you're keeping track of the finishes and they've got to make years sure later, that... What's the stupidest thing we can yeah. make Vincent Verheyen say out loud 19 years from now? Like, the guy's pinned, but let's not pin him and then just do a bullshit finish. So, the LWO comes out. Eddie cuts a promo on Viano. It's half Spanish, half English. He wants him to join the LWO, and Viano accepts because they had a wrestling match for five minutes. 
why didn't Viano join like a month ago? I don't know. Like, what the hell's been going on here? What changed between the opening of the show and in this match that that changed Viano's mind? Like, when they offered him a shirt, I was so mad. That was the first time that I wrote, in all caps, I hate this show. First time? First time I wrote it here tonight. <sighs> Nitro Party Clips. Not only did they have their own Nitro Girls, they had an honest-to-God ring. Yeah. One of the best Nitro parties they've had. Wrath versus Al Green, on a very depressing note, they pointed out the referee was Brady Boone, which caused me to look it up. He's dead. The day after this show. Oh, really? Whoa. He was I right. did he, not he know did, that. He did this Nitro, he did their TV taping the next night, he was driving home the next night, and he was in a car wreck and died. God, I didn't know it was that soon. Now we're all Jeez. depressed. Well, I thought actually it was much earlier, which is why I looked it up. Mm. I, I, I couldn't be Brady Boone, but it was. So... Wrath and Al Green had a too long and boring match, but everyone still did go crazy when Wrath hit the meltdown for the win. But that's the only thing they care about now. Like, they've killed Wrath, and they're trying to push him as the next Goldberg, even though, like, he lost. So, like, he's not going to be the next Goldberg. Went five times longer than it needed to. And, like you said, the finish was just a meltdown. What the fuck took so long? I don't know. Like, Goldberg has to wrestle ten minutes just to do a jackhammer. He gets in there, he kills him, he does a jackhammer. Why is Wrath going toe-to-toe with Al Green for five minutes? That's a great question. Well, here we go. A bad show went flying off the rails. <sighs> but you know what? Before it went flying off the rails, this was great. Bischoff was funny. Bischoff was great. So, I've said this a million times. This is a great example. There's a difference between being a, between being a good talker and being a great promo. Miz is a great talker. One time in his entire career, I've wanted to see someone beat his ass. It's when he did the deal with Daniel Bryan. Eric Bischoff came out here. He talks for like two minutes. I am begging for Ric Flair to come out here and just beat the shit out of the guy. He was such a great heel. He Exactly. He was, everything he said, he was totally full of shit. And you, the viewer, knew that. But you also knew that Eric believed his own Yes! Bullshit. Exactly. So, as Craig noted... Eric Bischoff said, he talks about Flair being stuck in the past and I'm looking to the future. Then he warns Ric Flair, as Craig noted, I am a trained killer. Yeah. And he pauses for a reaction and there is none, which made it all better. It actually made it better. He talks about his karate background. I can... He says, I spent seven years seven years honing my craft. Now, honing as a craft. longtime fucking martial artist, I was like, seven years? You did karate for seven years? I was like, Flair, come out here and just kill this guy. So he trained to be a trained killer for seven years. Yeah, seven whopping years. <laughs> That's a lot of bodies. Dude. <laughs> so he called Flair an old man, threatened to murder him with karate punches. That's well, right. He's a trained killer. I guess so. He was he was Craig at the border. The right one hits hard. The left one scares even me. That's not what I said, Brian. May as well have. So... Flair runs out. They play hide and seek for a bit. Eventually, Bischoff flees to the back, and Flair returns for a crazy. Oh, promo. dude! I'll kill you if you don't. I'll kill you like Bischoff is going to kill whoever. This was the best chase in the history of wrestling. <laughs> Flair is trying to get this guy, and they're playing tag. And all of a sudden, Bischoff makes a break for it, and he is fucking running. And Ric Flair runs even faster, and Bischoff sees him coming, and he sprints for everything that he's worth they're running so fast that bischoff splits off to the left and flair is running so fast he can't split off <laughs> like a train <laughs> he just keeps running straight up the ramp bischoff is out of here i've never seen two guys run like this on a wrestling show it's almost like one wanted to kill the other and the other one was terrified that's this, exactly what this, this guy was. May try to kill me so flair gives up on the chase he goes back to do his crazy promo I believe this is the first time he did a shtick of doing wrestling moves to an invisible man. Nah, he's done it before. Has he? Yeah, but yeah. this was the first time he did the flare bump into the corner. He did the flare flip in the corner <laughs> yeah. at, at random, doing elbow drops to the logo, knee drops to the mat. They're in Florida, so he talks about all the times he bled in Florida with the Funks and Wyndham's and Dusty. Threatened to strangle Bischoff half to death. So he's, mer he's, he's getting more merciful by the week. <laughs> Although he did say... He would pull out Bischoff's heart to show he had no heart. And then, speaking of hearts, Flair goes to the corner, collapses, grabs his chest. Okay, so for those of you that don't remember this at the time, 
I just want to make one statement here as we review the rest of this show. There were people who thought that this was real. How? Flair goes down in the corner, and Gene Okerlund, ever the professional, says, we're going to head to a break. But they don't go to a break. He actually said, he said over the mic, get the camera off him. Yep. So he zoomed in for a close-up. Yep. Says, this man has hurt himself. Arn runs down, the doctor, the stretcher. The camera's on it the whole time. Mm Mm-hmm. And they cart this guy backstage all the way into getting him into the ambulance. David Crockett's there. David Flair is there. People thought this was real. Let me, let, let, let's, let's, let's go over here. They don't treat him. They don't do CPR. No. They don't give him any medicine. They load the heart attack man onto a gurney and wheel him away. <laughs> they do nothing to stem the tide. Nothing to treat him. No. They just figure, we don't want him to die on TV. Let's let him die in the ambulance. I mean, somewhat to be fair, Gene goes to the booth, and Gene has a health update. And Gene claims this was the shoulder that Flair had operated on. So I guess we're supposed to believe that at the time, they thought Flair had hurt his shoulder. For a half hour. Not had a heart attack. For a half hour, the announcers believe this has been a shoulder injury due to all the wacky bumps he was taking. Yes. Which would be fine, except... When he was in the corner and a guy's attending to him, you could clearly hear Arn say he's having a heart attack. <laughs> well, Arn's no doctor. <laughs> I, I don't, I, yeah. Kudos to Ric Flair for going along with this, by the way. He was a company man. Not to mention, everyone's there carting him into the ambulance. And so, Bam Bam Bigelow takes the opportunity to sneak inside. It's true. Very quickly, before we get to that, as they're loading Rick into the ambulance and Arn's saying, I'll go to the hospital with him, and Rick, Rick's calling Arn's name, Arn turns and shouts, somebody get his wallet and all that shit. <laughs> Notice that. So they load they load Flair in the ambulance, and yes, as they're loading Flair in, Bigelow sneaks into the building. How convenient. Amazing time. Oh, he's just outside waiting for his chance. There's, there's Hall... Why did Scott Hall crotch chop Bam Bam Bigelow? Fuck if I know. What? I, if I recall correctly, they had heat in WWF, like for real. So, like the click and Bigelow didn't get along. Yeah, yeah, like that. I, I know that happened. But it's fucking the, Nitro. The Nitro audience is gonna remember that four years later. Vinny, do you watch the show? All they do is shit that no one has any idea what's going on. That's true. That's true. So Bam Bam whipped his ass. Nash arrives and shouts at Bigelow, and Goldberg's there. We get. Many, many, many minutes of these three men being holed back and shouting. And somewhere in here, Terry Taylor booked a three-way. <laughs> when they announced that the main event of this show was going to be Goldberg, Nash, and Bigelow, my blood started to boil. And boy, it got to a, a true boiling point a little bit later on this program. But I just was like, you promised this fucking match last week, and you didn't deliver it. Now, us fucking idiots are supposed to believe that you're actually going to deliver it this week? Who do you think we are? Well, the answer is, they think we're idiots. They do. As we're going to find out here in a second. So, this whole thing, from Eric Bischoff coming out to Terry Taylor booking a three-way, I didn't time it. It had to have been at least 20 minutes. Probably more. It went forever. One great, big, long segment. And... I don't remember how I reacted 19 years ago, but in the decades since, I've lost friends to heart attacks. This was no fun at all. This was shit. This was bullshit, is what this was. So it's been, let's see, they had the the, the Bischoff promo, the heart attack, the brawl, and then before that, there was, God, I'm way up my notes here. Uh, We had Wrath and Al Green. So it's been a half hour since the last match. Mean Gene brings Kidman out for a promo. (laughs) You fucking kidding me? What'd they say? Kidman calls out Ray. He I, he thanked Ray, I think he said for opening doors, but he stressed, for little guys like us. That's a quote. Little guys like us. Well, he could say that. He's bigger than Ray. I understand his name is Kidman. And they're, they are little. We don't have to come out and say it. He offered Ray a title match. If Ray promised no LWO interference, Ray accepted. I was so furious here. As we'll get to later, Ray accepts a match and says, the LWO will not interfere tonight. I'm like, who the fuck do you think we are? And once again, the answer was, well, we think you guys are idiots. 
Because they do a fucking match, and what happens, Vinny? Well, you see, they're doing this match, and nobody cares because some of them thought Ric Flair might be dead. <laughs> so none of them care about the match. The announcers have now gotten word about shortness of breath and chest pains, and they're very somber. It's already a flat match. Kidman goes to a long chin lock. This thing just keeps going. And about two hours in, LWO runs in for the DQ. Fuck everyone. These fans were so pissed off. Not even good heat. Just angry, low, rumbling booing. There was one pop, and that's when Kidman performed a top rope sky high on Rey Mysterio, and that was the only pop in the match. But it was a very spectacular looking move, but the crowd just really didn't care. No. Who so, could possibly watch this show? Like, how can you not switch to Raw? I don't know. So, the other of you runs in. Ray and Kidman work together to clean house. And then I think, I think Kidman may have legit forgot how they're supposed to end. Because he leaves, they beat up Ray, he comes back, and they beat him up too. They replayed the entire segment from when Bam Bam came into the building to the point it was separated and Terry Taylor booked the match. This is seriously like five minutes, and they played the whole thing over again. Now, I will say this. The second time, I it was very clear, not only did Terry Taylor book them in a three-way, he also promised there would be no run-ins. Excuse me? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> he promised there would they, be no run-ins. They told us, stick around for this main event. We promise you're going to get a three-way, and nobody is going to run in. How can they promise that? They actually said those words. Yeah, that's what Terry Taylor, the Red Rooster, said to me, the viewer. Idiots. Assholes. I was so angry when I heard that. Now, I knew he was lying when he said it, but even if you take him at his word, why don't you do that for all the matches? <laughs> well, there is that. There is that. Chris Jericho comes out for a promo, brings out some guy dressed like Conan, has a whiteboard, he's trying to explain how Conan used a bunch of foreign objects to beat him last week. And he I, beat it for fake Conan and nobody cared. I was just watching this thing thinking, you know... This might have been funny. No. But on this fucking show, this was absolute television death. Crowd was so dead for all of this, and it sucked. This was not Jericho's best material. What do we follow that up with? Well, the Nitro Girls danced, and ordinarily I don't point that out anymore, but the Nitro Girls were the only positive thing about the show so far. So I'm going to credit them for keeping the show at some level of watchability. Emery Hale versus Barry Windham. Emery Hale versus Barry Windham. Head to head with Monday Night Raw, you say? Mm -hmm. Man, oh man. Crowd was comatose. <laughs> Barry's out there wrestling, not only in blue jeans, but also a denim vest. The whole match. I went back and forth for two minutes. Barry won with a superplex. Norman Smiley versus Saturn. You know, this was where I first heard the announcement that the main event was going to have no run-ins. And they said no outside interference, because I guess a run-in and fucking outside interference are two different things. But what made me so mad about it was, number one, like, fuck you. And number two, if you're going to do the stip where you're going to tell us to stick around for the main event, because there will be no outside interference... Why the fuck did you do that thing with Rey Mysterio where you promised no outside interference and fucking guys ran in? Like, are you that stupid? Why is this so hard? So Norman Smiley's wrestling Saturn. Crowd is tw chanting twinkle toes at Norman, which I don't think he was used to getting any kind of reaction at all. So he kept, kept looking at them and, 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 and inciting more. Saturn snapped and whipped his ass. Maybe the coolest thing on the show, Saturn had a really cool chicken wing waist lock, waist lock suplex. That was awesome. The real best thing on this show and in this match was when the ref went down. Shat sneaks into the ring. He gives Saturn a super kick and then he does the robot and a crotch chop. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. So, Saturn is dead. He is a dead body. And Norman Smiley makes the cover. And since the ref is down, to play off last week, Scott Dickinson runs down and he gives a fast count to a dead guy. Yeah. I hate, I hate this show. He got DVD last week, Brian. He was mad. 
the guy was dead. What the fuck did you need to fast count for? I mean, hello. Like, I want to rewrite my whole book. I was not. <laughs> you were too kind. On I them. was too kind. You went too easy. This well, fucking sucked. They paid off the thing from last week. Get out of here. Come on. Yeah, now where does it go from here? Probably nowhere. Bret Hart came out for a promo. Oh, here's another good one. They're trying to convince us that Ric Flair had a heart attack. Yeah. Fucking Bret Hart comes out, he's just, hey, they're dropping like flies. Yes. That's what he said. People thought <laughs> he had a heart attack. So Bret's talking about how everyone's hurt because he put him on the shelf. He, of course, still has a bad groin, but he's still fighting through it. He's a three-time U.S. champ. He said that, and I was like, record scratch. I watch the show every single week. Where were we? Yeah. There was, I remember there was the one with Luger. Remember Luger won, it was like an awesome moment, and then the next week, Brett just showed yeah, up with the belt be again. Because then he lost it to Page won it back. Yeah, so there you go. So I, when he went the first time? Sting? No, the first time was Luger. First time was Luger. So he won it from Luger, lost it to Page and got it back, that's two. There must have been one other one somewhere. Yeah. Who did, gives he, a shit? did him and Page point trade is, it off once, They twice. may have, I don't remember. Brett hasn't even been with this company a year. And there's already been so many title switches, we can't keep track of them all. So, well, you know, if 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 they actually recapped when he won and lost titles, unlike with the Luger thing where he just showed up with the belt, and they never showed us one recap, if I recall. That's true. Of, of him winning the belt They just back. said he won it on Thunder. Yeah. yeah. So he calls out DDP, offers him a U.S. title match. Out comes Paige. Geek of the week. Falls for this. <laughs> Brett's hey. talking about his horrible groin injury, but he's willing to defend the title. Paige is then attacked by a big, fat giant and a wife beater. He had to have been fatter here than he was in that Rumble we just Seriously, watched. where do you find a wife beater this big? That's a good question. I mean, this had to have been made by somebody in the back. There's no way this is merchandise. They're, they can't make money off of it. No. It's who's impossible. Gonna, who's going to buy a 12-foot wife beater? Nobody. Have to, One guy. Have to plow an extra cotton field. To... <laughs> so he's out here looking like a bigger, even fatter Cassius Ono. He tears apart the big WCW metal logo. He chokeslams Paige off the logo set through a wood thing. They go to break. It was awesome because Dude. you ever seen Ki the you know Wiley Coyote hit the side of the mountain and there's the impression of the Wiley Coyote where he hit the mountain. Yes, this is what happened with Paige. He got choke slammed through this stage and there was a there was a hole that was shaped like Paige. Paige shaped he, hole. <laughs> as he crashed. Yeah, the through. side of him since giants choke slammed him sideways through the stage. Yeah. Couldn't even drop him back first. Conan versus Stevie Ray. Can I at least put over that Bret Hart's absolute bullshit look of shock when the giant came out and choke slammed him actually was the best thing on this show? We can be fair. Yes. When something good happens, we will point it out. Celebrate it, really, because it's so rare. Bret's face was just amazing. So Conan versus Stevie Ray. Wade Boggs, baseball player, Brian, was in the front row. And so I've heard of Wade Boggs. Stevie Ray gets in his face. Wade Boggs was trying so hard not to laugh. He, he should have just laughed. Almost succeeded. So Booker T goes to use the slapjack, but Booker T takes it away, and Conan wins with the next factor. Dude, this fucking slapjack. I mean, could it have been any bigger? Like, how the hell did you hide that in your tights? It was like the size of... It's a great setup line. Jesus Christ. This show sucks. Conan's give a crap is gone. Uh, he actually... He ever up. did? He <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> he came out with his wristwatch still on. In this athletic competition, he didn't even bother did to take his watch off. Did you see <laughs> the high spot they did right before the X Factor? It was so bad. Bischoff comes out for a promo. It's it, it's serious now. Oh he's yeah, got a, he's got a sweatshirt on, a white sweatshirt on to cover up the logo. He's got sun or his uh, eyeglasses on. He says, "Listen, earlier tonight, we did what we do to try to entertain people." And people sometimes ask about this business and just how real is it? Oh, fuck this. <laughs> fuck this fucking show. Hey, I'm actually going to say one positive thing about Eric here and this segment. When he came out, everybody's booing him. They're just hating this whole thing. He actually came across so sincere that the fans gave a standing ovation when he left. Some did. But still, there, I mean, there was ha there, he got half golf claps and half low dole booze. Hey, 
That's pretty impressive. Fair enough. Because he convinced a lot of people this was real. And I mean, come on. Yeah. So they go to break. The president of the company has just let everyone know we're all dropping character. This isn't part of the show. Ric Flair may, is actually having a heart attack. We hope it's mild. And they come back, and here's Mean Gene, and he's just as mean Gene as he's ever oh, been before. Oh, man, he's all excited. He don't give a shit. Hey, we're here on national television. He calls out Booker T. An all-time great. He did call Booker T an all-time great. Yes. Here, before he'd ever main evented, I think, a single show. Booker T offers prayers to Flair and his family. He says, Stevie Ray made his choice. He has joined the NWO. Stevie comes out. He's mad at Booker. You shouldn't be praying for Ric Flair. You should be praying for yourself. These stupid people don't give a darn about you. That's what he said. Took credit for looking after Booker when they were kids, making him part of a great tag team in Harlem Heat. Said, you need one of these. And he gave, an, gave him an NWO shirt and he left. And Booker had nothing to say and he walked away. Backstage, <laughs> a mysterious woman identified herself as Scott's mother. I was 80s. done. <laughs> I was fucking done when Raven's mom showed up. I was thinking of Scott Hall, Scott Steiner, Scott Norton. I forgot about Scott Levy. Raven's mom's there. The only good thing about this was Canyon trying to get 50 bucks out of her uh-huh. to take her to Raven. She had claimed she had she had boarded a Learjet. She came all the way here uh, in her Learjet. Because that's what people say. Get the fuck out of here. This show is so horrible. And then they go back to the announcers and Tony says, and... I quote, to say that we are drained is a gross understatement. I was like, just wait, dude. Just you wait, buddy. I feel you, Tony. I feel you. We have Scott Hall versus Horace. So Scott's on his way down to the ring. Tony, who is drained, which is a gross understatement, now he says, Flair allegedly had a heart attack. He seems to be doing okay, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> okay that was that was his update so they had a basic boring match here I will say looking for positive things to say oh by the way they also noted they'll be in Charlotte Thursday oh great what timing oh, nice <laughs> yeah looking for positive things to say Horace had a long sleeper and Hall almost went out but when his arm didn't drop the third time and he fired up to his feet because he was a heel for almost his entire career these are the the Top level. I know there was a brief Razor Ramon babyface run, but he was so wacky selling the sleeper, but also firing up and getting the crowd behind him. Everyone started to cheer on what had been a very long, very bad show. When, so, he, when he put the sleeper on, I actually fell asleep. That's also possible, but, yeah. yeah. So credit to Scott Hall for waking everyone up after the sleeper hold. And then the B-teamers hit the ring for the DQ. At least this was shorter than the Ray and Kidman match. Oh, Disco who apparently has joined the wolf pack and no one else knows it. Well, he's he's just got himself a shirt. He bought a shirt? Yeah, it's, it's Merch very stand. confusing. He runs out to hit the ring and make the save. Here's another good thing. This, at the time, I thought was the best thing in the show. Scott Norton grabbed him and powerbombed him in half. <laughs> oh, oh, my God, he killed him. <laughs> howled with laughter. Oh, my God, he just killed this <laughs> just guy. Just destroyed him. This was one of those powerbombs where the guy's knees actually hit him, hit him in the face yeah. Yeah. when they come down. Yes. He just folded him in half. It was amazing. Oh, it was beautiful. Van Hammer versus Scott Steiner. Can you imagine they put this on television? <laughs> Scott Steiner and Van Hammer. Why couldn't I have four extra minutes of the main event? Well, because we needed Van Hammer on the show, and we needed Steiner doing a promo talking about something that was cackleated. <laughs> Van <laughs> Hammer said. <laughs> doing his hippie gimmick for maybe the first time. I forget. I don't think so. No, he, he may have. No, he didn't. Okay. Regardless. The music was new. I see. Regardless, Steiner killed him, beat him with a Steiner recliner. Goes to cut his promo. He did, in fact, say that everything the NWO did was calculated. Calculated. He calls out Lex Luger. He says, Lex, like Dusty wrote that promo. <laughs> Lex, Lex should be fighting for the world title. He should have won World War III. Maybe Dusty was going to write the promo for him, but Steiner was like, I, I can't read all that. Just tell me what you want me to say. And Dusty said, and everything the NWO is calculated. So he went Maybe out there and pulled it off. Dusty dictated it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and his iPhone picked right. it up. Cack. Cack. Elated? Calculated. Okay. Whatever. Hold it down. You're the boss. There's no squiggly line back then. No. You had to write it on a piece of paper. That's right. And get a dictionary like on that NWA show. So Lex comes out to hear what they have to say. Bagwell starts talking about how he broke his neck and Lex is the one who got him back in the ring. What? 
When did this happen? Where did, the, where did well, this Well, he from? said that when he was when he was injured, he called Lex for exercise advice. Yeah, advice. I see. Yeah. All right. Because, you know, all those times Lex broke his fucking neck, had to come back. Uh, they say Conan, Nash, and Sting, they've never done anything for you. You're always giving Lex, you never receive. And they offered him the black and white shirt, but Lex just smiled and walked away. At last, it was time for the main event. Okay, can I just say something about this here? Last week, it was supposed to be Nash, Goldberg, and Bigelow. Mm-hmm. Right? They mm-hmm. announced that midway through the show. Yep. They talk about it the whole show, and then it doesn't happen. This week, they start talking about it again. They sign the match. They announce it will be no disqualification or no run-ins, no interference, there will whatever. Be no run-ins. They, they plug it for an hour and a half. Bigelow starts coming down to the ring, and Tony says... This is an unexpected match. A fucking unexpected match? You've been talking about it for two weeks now. What happened at the end? Well, before we get to the end, it went, it went like three or four minutes. It was mostly fine. There was a point where Goldberg locked Nash in a knee bar, and Goldberg's not the most delicate worker, and Nash is not the most sturdily built man. <laughs> like 20 years later, I screamed, careful! Yes, he's brittle. Yes, and he just had his knee replaced. Maybe because of this knee bar for all I know. Goldberg gets a couple of spears, but he's never able to get the jackhammer. He's going to do it to Nash. And then Scott Hall attacks him. He runs in when they promised there would be no runs in. He runs in for outside interference. He out- interferes from the outside. It's a disqualification in a three-way match where we were promised there would be no run-ins. It only gets worse. <laughs> Please tell me that someone somewhere was punched in the face as a result of this show. Doubtful. Someone needed physical beatings. Doubtful. So there's four guys. What's funny fighting. is at the time Eric was trying to lay the law down. Like apparently Stevie Ray didn't want to do a job for Conan. And Bischoff got wind of it and said, Fuck you, you're doing this job. He was trying to lay down the law during this this show. So Hall and Bigelow are brawling on the floor. Nash and Goldberg, who are main eventing the pay per view in two weeks. Had a miserably bad brawl in the ring. <laughs> My God! <laughs> and the show ends that way. Brian, do you have the finisher music ready? Oh, yeah, I can get it ready. I'd like to note, by the way, that at the time of this show, Goldberg's merch sales had slowed down drastically. They couldn't figure out why. <laughs> huh. Weird. All right. What music do we use? I... <laughs> You pick. I don't know the names. The contest music. Sure. sure. Just something wacky. That's that's a, that's what it was. All right. Hold on here. Damn it. Why is this so hard? Here uh, we go. I feel bad. There we go. The finishes on this show were no match because Raven was whiny. No finish because one guy was recruited to join the other guy's gang. Clean pin. DQ when Mexicans attacked an hour into the match. Clean pin. Pin on a fast count by a biased ref after the first ref got bumped and two dudes interfered. Pin after a guy pulled out a foreign object but didn't use it. DQ due to gang attack. Clean submission though it was with a crooked ref. And DQ due to run-in in a three-way where they promised there would be no run-ins in this three-way. There you go. WCW Monday Night Show 171, December 21st, 1998. So there's a recap of the Outsiders arriving and Eric Bischoff joining the NWO and all the evil things he's done. And all this did was remind me that the NWO is now going on for two and a half years. (laughs) It's it's weird. They started showing the video package with Hall and Nash showing up and it was one of those deals where I thought I watched the wrong show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then the video package keeps going, and there's Reed and David Flair. Yes, and I'm like, I, sh- I surely watched the wrong show. <laughs> but it turns out that was on Thunder. Apparently on Thunder, they yes. beat up the Flair boys. And and then Eric kissed Flair's wife. Which, which number was that? I think two. Okay. So, as Brian noted, you're trying to win a wrestling war. You want eyeballs you want people to stop up the channel and stay in your screen so what do you do you put fit finley and scott putsky in the ring for 15 minutes i think the idea was that putsky was local 
and the fans would like to see him go in there and do real good against Fit Finley. I think that was the idea. Hmm. Okay. Fuck that idea. Like, it's still Fit Finley versus Scott Putsky, and you're on national television. I described it like this. The match was okay, but it was okay for 15 minutes. Yeah. That's not okay, though. That's, exactly. That's the problem. Yeah. And they just did hold after hold after hold after hold. To their credit, the crowd got into Putsky this is what when I he realized. started his comeback. Fit Finley, I said this before, the most underrated wrestler of the Monday Night Wars. People were into Scott Putsky's comeback. Yeah. T- in a 15-minute match. They'd just sit in there forever. In the opener. They'd seen nothing yet. My big problem came when they're doing all these moves and it's time for a commercial break. I see where you're going. And they go to commercial, okay? <laughs> now, the good news is it wasn't right after a dive. Mm-hmm. They just went to commercial during one of the 5,000 holds in this match. They come back, and both men are standing in the middle of the ring, and Finley wants a handshake. They just start over. They literally started over again. <laughs> this was 25 minutes of the program in real time. Scott Putsky versus Fit Finley. And then Putsky missed a Polish hammer. Finley hit the rolling fireman's carry and a tombstone for the win. There you go. I, I was pretty mad, but <laughs> I, I was go. doing okay now. I was doing all right. Like maybe, the maybe something exciting, interesting will happen. Sure. I was like, no. you know, something weird just happened, but you know. At the end, the there, guy, there's two and a half hours left. Let's at, see what happens. At the end, the mid car guy beat the bottom of the car guy, and this 15, 20, 25, whatever it was, established nothing. So, as I noted, it's 25 minutes in the show. The show began with a recap of the Eric Bischoff Ric Flair thing. They air a 15 minute Scott Putsky match, and when it's over, they aired the Eric Bischoff Ric Flair recap again. Mm-hmm. Are well, you absolutely kidding me? <laughs> By the way, in that 15-minute Scott Putsky match, the announcers very casually mentioned, yes, fans, Ric Flair did have a heart attack on live TV next week, but he will still be competing at Starcade. Well, they didn't quite say that. They said the match is still on. We'll see if he can compete. Uh-huh. Yes. I'll- so for those of you that don't remember, the storyline was supposed to be that Eric Bischoff poisoned oh, yeah, Ric yeah. Flair. But then they realized that's stupid. It's also criminal. This fucking company realized that's stupid. And so now, just, he's back. So they didn't even bother to explain it. No. By the way, they showed more of the angle with the uh, David and Reed Flair on Thunder. <laughs> Do you remember your reaction to the referee who had no reaction when Saturn hit him with the DVD? <laughs> yes. Reed Flair, the same reaction to David Flair getting choke slammed. <laughs> well, what's he going to do? Well, well he's his older brother. That, that crossed my mind, too. He's probably happy about it. He yeah. probably paid Brian Adams off to do this. Now, you've already... You're trying to win a wrestling war. We need to establish this, folks. This is life and death. They are fighting for their careers. And in the end, they lost, and WCW has lost its career. So you've done a 15-minute match with Scott Putsky. How should we follow this up? If you voted, let's do an angle with Cat and Santa Claus, you may work for WCW. The Cat comes out for a promo, talking about how great he is, daring fans to fight him. Santa Claus appears in the aisle throwing candy to children. Because that's what Santa does, is throws candy. Cat dares Santa Claus to get in the ring. Tony explains Cat has been beating up Santa Claus on house shows around the region. Really? I didn't know that. That's what he said. God said. damn, that's news to me. Cat throws a punch. Santa ducks it, hits a pair of suplexes. He begins to disrobe. <laughs> he's in the middle. He doesn't even. He still has half the costume and makeup on. They're able to establish it Saturn, and then it's to the break. Like he still has the, the beard and the nose. Man, half Saturn, half Santa was a monstrosity. <laughs> you thought the guy was ugly before. I mean, put a beard on him and white and eyebrows. Nose, yeah. Oh, my God. It's horrifying. And then. 30 minutes in real time since the show began, they air the Nitro Open. Yeah. Yes. Because legally, you must air the Open at oh. some point on the program. Huh. With the show officially underway, I guess, it's time for the opener. Kaz Hayashi. It's not the opener. 
I'm, well, they just did the opening. I see. Yeah. Yes. Kaz Hayashi versus Chavo Guerrero Jr. I mean, I could have understood if you would have forgotten the Putski match by now, but... <laughs> So, Chavo's um, got his stick horse. Did, did you watch this one? Um, I watched the end of it. I was, I was so I was so mad. You I just skipped nothing. past the had, stick horse. They had a fast-paced three-minute match. Chavo won with a tornado DDT. Yippee. I used to really like Kaz Hayashi until I started watching him again. I'm sure it'll pick up. Okay. I'm not. Why? Why would it? I don't know. To, <laughs> the company's going to get better. I was trying to. Be They're nice. going to devote more time to the cruiserweights later. The young dragons did some fun stuff. Vinny okay. was trying to be Mr. Brightside. <laughs> yes. Why? <laughs> never has before. That's Somebody's true. got to. I'll never make it through the show. They replayed the Goldberg Nash Bigelow angle from last week, including once again Terry Taylor promising nobody will run in. Mm-hmm. And then they showed Scott Hall running in. Liar. God, why? Why would you air that in the recap? Because they're WCW. Just to further piss people off. That's a great question, actually. And just tell them, don't believe anything that we say, because it's all bullshit. <laughs> Here comes Kevin Nash. That's your segue. First off, what, was it a, was it a jersey? Yes. It was God a, damn, it was this a was. Dale Earnhardt jersey. This Dale Earnhardt oh, jersey was so yeah. atrocious, and he tucks it into his fucking jeans. Well. Which are hiked up. He's doing the duck face that teenage girls do for selfies nowadays. Fucking walks down to the ring Trend and just leans on the ropes and Makes does this look thinner, I think. promo about Goldberg where I swear to God, he brags about his own WWF championship reign. The fucking worst championship reign of the modern era of any import. He's talking about how it's a big deal. Well, you see, Brian, he defended that title 190 times and never lost. 197. So that streak is more impressive than Goldberg's streak of a mere 173 wins. Yeah, he's an idiot. Now, when he mentioned Goldberg the first time, it was roundly booed. They booed Goldberg's name. They yeah. did. Now, later in the promo, there was a Goldberg chant. So the, he still had his supporters, but there was, in fact, an, a, a, a strong anti-Goldberg contingent, at least in St. Louis. Yeah, I wonder why. Let's, let's take a guy, and it's a certain way to book him, and then let's just stop. <laughs> And see what happens. So, Nash wishes Flair well, then steals his line of saying, to be the man, you gotta beat the man, and Goldberg, on Saturday night, I'm gonna kick your ass. I thought this was a hell of a promo. The final line was great. I wasn't down with the rest of it. Listen, I was there through his WWF title run. That was so stupid. He mentions WWF so people cheer on a WCW show. The Nitro Girls danced, which I mentioned because they had a new member this week named Storm, who would later gain greater fame as Her Royal Majesty Queen Charmel. Wow. Yeah. Raven and Canyon. Okay. Can mm. I read the first line of my review? If you want to. Fuck my life. Wow. <laughs> that's where I really that's where I really hit the wall. Right here in this segment. I it's been I guess only two weeks, but Raven's mother. There's nowhere in this brain of mine. Not one gray cell retained any memory of Raven's mom being a regular character on Nitro. I wrote a fucking book about this. <laughs> then I wrote an expanded book about this. Mm-hmm. Then I created an audiobook. <laughs> I have no memory whatsoever of this fucking bullshit storyline. It's got to be over this week, right? There's no way it goes longer. Mrs. Levy, you don't think she hangs out for another month? I prefer the name Mama Raven. Dude... So Raven says, my mom's only here to get on TV. She saw Judy Bagwell win a tag team championship. She figures she can spear Goldberg and win the world title. Well, logically, she's not wrong. I just love that Raven is openly burying the other WCW storylines, because why not? Why wouldn't he? They're awful. Well, exactly. Why wouldn't you? I, I, all those things he said happened. I know. That's what makes it so great. The only great thing about this. I think that Judy Bagwell is still one half of the tag team champions. Am I wrong? <laughs> to my knowledge, yes. But we'll, Yeah. <laughs> she was never pinned, I know that. So, Raven, Canyon says something smart. Raven starts beating him up. Here's Mama Raven to the rescue. Flying herself in the Learjet to Nitro's all over the country just to try and see her son, Scotty. And she pleads with him to stop. Something's wrong. You need to come home. You need to see your doctor. Raven said, fine. They all left together. This is so bad. Let me tell you something. When she said, you've got to come home, and he said, I don't want to, 
Mm-hmm. And she says, no, you got to come home. And he goes, fine. And starts walking in the back. Geek of the millennia. Okay? <laughs> Nothing compares to this. I have never, ever... Like, how did he survive this? I mean, He's a very it, it must have been man. because nobody else remembered this. That's true. Because that's a career killer right there. That is a career killer. This this segment here on this show. She also said, said that he needs to go back to therapy. He needs to see his doctor and this, that, and the other thing. Are you getting the impression that she was trying to drag him to rehab? Fuck if I know. Who because, cares? Because his, his gimmick is that he is a, an addict. Is it? We don't know. Well, he, every time he comes into the ring, he sits in the corner, he rubs the inside of his arm like he's well, been Well, you know, he's, he's depressed. Yeah, so his, his gimmick is he's a whiner. Yeah, he's okay. depressed. I mean, he's just itchy. He may or may not be using as well. So he needs Ritalin. <laughs> he's more what he needs is to get the fuck off my TV. I'm sick of this shit. Bischoff comes out for a promo. I was initially furious. I was like, we're following up Raven's mother with more Eric Bischoff. But I was wrong. So what happened was, as Bischoff is running his mouth, the horsemen are running wild backstage. But the funny thing was, they apparently either forgot to or just chose not to put any of the horseman stuff on the big screen. No, no, no. It was on the big screen. He had to pretend he couldn't see it. Hmm. And it was a giant screen. If that's the case, why didn't none of the fans react either? Well, they were they were cheering. They cheered when Flair arrived on stage. But like when they were backstage beating up Scott Norton and putting him through a wall... Crowd didn't react much at all. I'll try and go back. I think it was on the screen. So. But there was also only one... Anyway, can I mention one thing about his promo before the Horseman came out? Sure. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Last week, Flair has an alleged heart attack. Eric Bischoff comes out, and he's really, really sad about it. Now he's out here celebrating it. Is this just because it was, like... I mean, I guess if you watch Thunder, he beat up the kids and kissed the wife. I don't know. I'm overthinking this. You are. What changed? They woke up Tuesday and said, hey, listen to have it. Why was he so sad last week? If he was just diabolical the whole time and it was, what's going on? Maybe he was still going to be poisoned by that point and they wanted to throw him, he wanted to throw the cops off the scent. Oh, I see. Had to feign sadness. And uh, anyway, so Flair comes charging down the aisle. Place goes crazy at that point. And he chases Bischoff out of the building out by the semi-trucks. Fans are demanding Flair. We want Flair. We want Flair. So he returns. He cuts a great promo in the middle of 29,000 screaming St. Louis people. On the graves of Dick the Bruiser, on the grave of Bruiser Brody, I promise that Bischoff will die if I get my hands on him. Bischoff and Wyndham. And Wyndham. Yeah, they will die in this arena if he gets his hand on them. We got his hands on Wyndham, and Wyndham didn't die. This was a great promo, and it was like, Two sentences. And it was his sec- not his best promo of the show. And listen, I may be in the minority here, but so far, his late 90s promos are way better than his mid-80s promos. He has been on a roll with the Bischoff stuff. Holy smokes. He's found his muse. He's, <laughs> yeah, he, fa- he found a motive. Exactly. He's, he's, he's found a, a motivation. Well, I mean, his 80s motive was chicks and being Ric Flair. I mean, that was real. Yes, but now, now it's death. <laughs> now it's hating Eric Bischoff. Maybe that's why it's better. He's angry now. DDP giant video package. Liz Merck Jr. versus Wrath. Why? Wrath beat the hell out of him on the floor and won with the meltdown in like two minutes. Cool. Nitro party clips. They went bowling. You know that video the WWE always shows about please don't try this at home? Right. Here was a highlight reel of people trying this at home. It's true. Doing like DDTs and torture racks at the bowling alley. On the alley. Yeah. And then at one point they put a kid on a dolly and bowled him down the alley. That's all. A bunch true. of idiots. Which I want to try sometime. <laughs> Eddie Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. You know, these guys have had some matches that have kind of sucked. A lot of holds and mm-hmm. shit. Sure. Well, I guess they decided here, those matches suck. Let's actually have a good one Let's for go once. Let's yes. Right. They have this fucking great match. One of the best Nitro matches in months. Absolutely. Eddie's beating his ass, tearing at his mask. They're tearing it up. Great comeback, high flying. All of a sudden, the ref takes a bump. Kidman runs down and jumps up on the apron. Possibly too soon. He acts like he's going to hit Eddie. He hits Ray. Eddie pins him. Now, none of us here have seen this. None of us are old enough. There's a very famous moment when 
Ivan Koloff beat Bruno San Martino in Madison Square Garden. And Bruno thought that he'd gone deaf when he took the flying knee. But what actually happened was the fans just went deadly silent when he got pinned and lost the title. Wow. That's what fucking happened here. These fans were so into this match. They're all excited. They're cheering. They get this fucking finish, and they just went silent. They did not boo. They did not cheer. They just were like, what? That's the fucking finish in this match? Fuck you. That's what they were thinking here. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. It was bizarre. You're not wrong. Wonky finish aside, this is very good pro wrestling and better than anything on Clash of Champions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Scott Steiner came out for a promo. What Vinny is about to say <laughs> is 100% true. I didn't write down everything he said. You don't need to. All you need to do is tell everybody they called out Mark McGuire. That part, yes. Mm -hmm. It was Buff Bagwell, mm -hmm. and then they made a bunch of steroid jokes. Right. They Scott Steiner. <laughs> Scott Matthew Steiner, whatever the hell his name is. He made fun of a professional athlete for using performance-enhancing substances. Muscle builders. Creatine? Anderson Dion. Okay. It was all the rage in the late 90s in the baseball era. Scott Carl Recksteiner. Thank you. <laughs> Carl? Carl? Scott <laughs> Carl Recksteiner. Yes. Accused another man of taking a shortcut for... for what are you insinuating, Vinny? The man is clean. Well, he's, he must be. He's a very hard worker. I would never accuse Scott Carl Recksteiner of being a hypocrite. Well, now, Robert Recksteiner, his brother, doesn't have a middle name. <laughs> Maybe it's Bert. No, it's... Rob just, Bert Recksteiner. No, it's Vinny. It's just Robert Recksteiner. Is it Rex no with a middle w? name. No, with a C-H. Oh. What do you mean with a W? You said Robert Carl... What'd you say? Recksteiner. The last Rex. Name, the last name is Recksteiner. Recksteiner. That's R not a W. Oh, that's an X, you R idiot. R-E-C-H. I thought he had Steiner. two middle names, like Rex. Get out of here. That's why... <laughs> Scott Carl Recksteiner... <laughs> He's got four uncles. I don't know. His last name is Rex Steiner, not Steiner. Steiner's a fake name. What? In wrestling? <laughs> Regardless, I'm they tried to burn the Mark McGuire jersey here in St. Louis. It would not light on fire. It went into business for itself. Yeah, oddly enough, the wrestlers don't know how to use a lighter. What? <laughs> they eventually got it on fire inside a trash can. This all made TV. Norman Smiley versus Prince Iakea. Did we mention, Brian, this company's trying to win a wrestling war? Did we mention this is the go-home show for Starcade? Ayaki used a shell shock. Now you know where Ryback got it. Norman won with a cross-faced chicken wing. God, you know, I know this is before, but, like, everybody has one weird wrestler that's their favorite. Sure. I wonder if that was seriously, like, Ryback's favorite wrestler when he was a kid. Prince fucking Ayakea. Hmm. I've heard stranger things. Yeah, like, next up, Barry Windham versus Hammer. There ain't much weirder than that, dude. Well, it didn't go very long. It went 30 seconds. Flair came screaming out to attack Wyndham for the DQ. And I gotta say, Flair in his promo earlier swore <laughs> on the graves of Dick the Bruiser and Bruiser Brody or whoever it was mm -hmm. that if he got his hands on Barry, Wyndham, or Eric Bischoff, he would kill them in this arena. I thought, man, that's a serious threat. He sh maybe shouldn't have said kill. Well, he fucking comes out here and tries to kill Barry Wyndham. He beat the shit out of this guy. Barry Wyndham was blown up merely from selling. Yeah. <laughs> like, he didn't even have to do anything no. except get chopped repeatedly, eye gouged, fish hooked, kicked in the balls multiple times. He's fucking laying there like he's about to have a heart attack. Flair's just completely on fire and the place is going nuts. Send out the geeks. Horsemen come down, destroy them. This was incredible. Flair gave him such a beating. It was glorious. And it went like five minutes. And you know, Flair hates being a babyface. Yeah. Like, Flair, all he wants is to be a heel, but he is the most unbelievably great babyface. The best part about the beatdown was the joy in which Arn Anderson stomped on Vincent again <laughs> and again and again. Yes, B-teamers kept hitting the ring only to be foiled by horsemen. It was Flair winning for seriously like five minutes, just, just, a, just a massacre, just a mauling. And then I started to run in. Eventually, they all started moving to the back, where security, and I can only assume because they were employed by Eric Bischoff, they maced and handcuffed the horsemen. While this is going on, Flair cut his other great promo on the show in the ring. 
He's going off about how Bischoff tried to shit can his career. Did not get bleeped. He said Reed had told him to beat Bischoff's ass. He made Reed promise every day he would never quit, which is very sad to hear. And then he says, he has moved on to, 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 to Bischoff kissing his wife. You kissed my wife, you no good rotten bastard. <laughs> He's delivered it with such fury. You've never heard a man so happy to say bastard. Oh, man. It was like Owen Hart saying ass. It was. <laughs> So Bischoff appears on stage. Flair immediately charges. Now, hold on. Don't gloss over this. <laughs> Flair is cutting like the greatest promo of all time. He's so angry. He's crying. He's so mad. He's ready to kill Eric Bischoff. And Bischoff comes out on the ramp. And as a viewer, I'm like, you're the dumbest fucking guy I've ever seen in my life. He's going to fucking kill you. And sure enough, Flair sprints after to kill him. And Doug Dillinger and the crew is there to form a human wall and stop Ric Flair. And Bischoff is mocking this guy, and they're cuffing Flair, and Flair's screaming, My wrists! God damn it! And he's jumping up and down and screaming, and he's threatening to kill Eric Bischoff. And it was like, as much as I love Vince McMahon and Steve Austin, okay? They are they are an all-time great pairing, but it's in a different way. It's It's a little more comedic. Yes. Like, Vince is a comic book villain. Steve Austin... Kicks his ass every single solitary week. It's never not funny. It's never not entertaining. It's wonderful. This is totally different. Ric Flair is the greatest baby face I, like, I had ever seen on this show. And Eric Bischoff was like the greatest heel that I'd ever seen. In the sense of, I so badly, like as a viewer, okay, I know it's fake, I was so mad when Doug Dillinger and the crew stepped out and stopped Ric Flair. I was so angry. I was begging for Flair to get his hands on this guy and give him the beating that he had given Barry Windham. And when it was prevented, I was like, Starcade. I wish I cable bill. I must watch this on the network like right right now. now. Now, if you know what happens, I mean, (laughs) don't pay to see it. It's fucking WCW, everybody. It's all you need to know. But still. Like they did, it was so great. I was, I needed to see Ric Flair get his hands on this guy. This vital. This is perfect professional wrestling right here in the middle of this shit show. Because Flair's the best. And Bischoff. And Bischoff's the best. Yeah, this is unbelievably awesome. And like you say, if, uh, if I didn't, if I wasn't spoiled by 19 years of knowledge, didn't know what I was in for. I would be in a hurry. I would be in a hurry to pay to watch this. Well, you know, part of the problem is I think a lot of people were in a hurry to purchase it. And their grand disappointment over the next two weeks yeah. is the beginning of the end for this. Actually, not the beginning of the end. It's the next step in the end <laughs> of this godforsaken It's the company. latest beginning of the end. I honestly cannot do justice to how great these two guys were. They played their roles perfectly. Burger T versus Jerry Flynn. That's a follow-up. That's a follow-up. Here's all I got to say about this match. Jerry Flynn got hairy. (laughs) He didn't used to be hairy. He's hairy now. What I got out of this was, first off, this crowd is going to take years for them to recover from the last segment. And the announcers spoke not one word about this match until the match ended, at which point they admitted, we didn't talk about this, and we don't care. All right. So we had an, uh, an amazingly great segment. We had a nothing match, and now it's time for some classic WCW stupidity. Oh, you don't even know. <laughs> Kenny Chaos versus Lex Luger. So they're doing a match. It's not very good. But everyone loves Luger, so it's going to be okay. In the middle of this, by the way, the announcers begin to ask, Hey, isn't Kenny Chaos still technically one half of the World Tag Team Champions? Because... He defended with, defended it with Rick the week before Judy Bagwell came out, and the belts haven't been seen since. So as far as anyone knows, Kenny Chaos and Rick Steiner are still the World Tag Team Champions. Which begs the question, why did the... In all seriousness, why did they bother having tag team titles? Ever since, like, Sting and Giant were already enemies when they won them and then split up, they've been useless. Beyond useless. A waste of time. Now... Lex is about to win with the torture rack. Everyone's going crazy because they love Lex's torture rack. Out comes Robbie Rage. 
with his arm in some kind of contraption. So Chaos is going to lose anyway, but Robbie Rage has to distract him, so he loses more. And Lex hits him from behind and puts him in the torture rack and wins. Couldn't just have Lex win. You needed this distraction finished by a guy with one arm. So then Rage and Chaos bicker. High voltage explodes, and we're supposed to care. What happened here? For those of you that just need a simple capsule explanation for what we just saw, Lex Luger was the backdrop for the beginning of a Rage versus Chaos program. Mm -hmm. Yes. What? Yes. Are you fucking kidding me? Lex Luger was the third wheel here. Yeah. He was a prop. He Dude. Was, he was a plot device. He was he was there well, to give other characters motivation. See, those two are so big, they needed another big guy in there to make them look not so big. So they chose Luger. That's the only thing I got. According to uh, Wikipedia here, uh, Judy Bagwell never officially a tag team champion. They only list the team of Rick Steiner and Chaos, and then the belts are vacated. <laughs> Wait, they're going to get Kenny Chaos to lay down for somebody? Apparently not. Rick was injured, so... Why did they... Th- this has to be the worst tag team division of all time. Oh, yeah. The past year of WCW. Well, I, know, I mean, we'd have to go through the Impact shows, but this is way up there. It's funny, too, because they have a lot of tag teams. Not anymore, they don't. Hell broke well, up. yes, but they're all... They have Harlem Heat, but they're broke up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Steiners broke up. Outsiders broke up. Okay, I see what you're saying. His point is they all broke up. Yeah. Yeah. They have the makings of a good tag team division, though. Well, they had 300 guys, whatever it was, on on the roster. I, yeah. Anyway, Conan comes out. Oh, amateur hour here. He begins to go to promo running down Alex Wright when Disco Inferno arrives in a Wolfpack t-shirt. Conan says, you just bought your shirt at the merch stand and put it on. You can't call yourself part of the Wolfpack. Disco has said, fine. Man, talk about a way to bury sales of that shirt. <laughs> All of you who think you're in the Wolfpack when you buy one of our shirts, you're not. It's just merch. <laughs> Disco, Disco says, fine, we'll go talk to Nash after the mac- match. I will prove I'm in the wolf pack. And then began Conan versus Alex Wright. This was so bad. Well, I mean, it wasn't as bad as the opener. Oh, it wasn't. No. As, I'm sorry, it wasn't no, as no, long no. as the It was opener. not as boring as the opener. Yeah. It went faster. I, if you want to say it was more fun than the opener, I might even accept that. But it was much, much Worse than the opener. I mean, it's just garden variety bad, and Conan gets blown up immediately as always. And then Conan is down on the mat, just just huffing and puffing for air. And Alex is like, "Shit, I gotta put a hold on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try a leg grapevine." He used the worst leg grapevine and toe hold there's ever been. Hulk Hogan's figure four was much better than this. <laughs> Zach Gowan could have done a better leg grapevine than this. I think actual grapes could have done a better leg grapevine than this. Well, they have experience. This was so bad. So then, eventually, Conan fires up. It's time for his comeback. But he he's still blown up. So he does, like, two moves. Then he has to go to an arm hold. He's got him in the arm hold, gasping for air, eyes bugging out. There are boring chants during the comeback, which I'm sure at some point I've seen before, but it's I don't, I don't think it's so. few and far between. This goes on for a while. Conan eventually, gradually, very, very slowly puts on a tequila sunrise and wins. This was significantly worse than anything at Clash of Champions. This was so bad. I love that they're doing a storyline where Alex Wright's losing his mind afterwards and throwing a tantrum because he lost from a submission. It's not like the guy can argue a fast count Mm -hmm. or my foot was under the ropes or whatever. He was submitted in the middle of the ring, yet he's angry. Stomps around. This is the least of our worries. Throws a fit. He was probably just embarrassed. I don't know. I was pretty mad about it. He was probably mad about how bad the match was. Oh, get out of here. So Jericho runs out and attacks Conan, puts the TV belt across his face, and does a quebrada onto it. There you go. So then Disco Inferno comes out. He says, I will prove I'm in the Wolfpack. 
I demand someone from NWO Hollywood come out so I can beat them and prove I am Wolfpack worthy. And he said, maybe Horace. <laughs> he did say maybe Horace. <laughs> he did not get Horace. He got the giant. And so we got big fat giant working over Disco Inferno in what had to be the longest three minutes of my life. You know, I was mad initially, but I mean, they are building up to giant versus DDP. But like Giant is about to leave. He's yes. on his way out. Yes. And he just smashes and destroys the Disco Inferno. Not to mention that he got Pyro on the way out. I had some buffering problems this week. It was more during Raw. I thought they were back here, but no. Giant was just moving that slowly. I thought my screen had frozen. <laughs> Eventually, he puts Disco on the top rope and choke slams him down and pins him. And then he cuts a promo that may have been more boring than the match. And Paige appears in the crowd, and they call each other fathead for a while. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Main event. Goldberg versus Scott Hall. They wrestled for a minute. Nash pulled Hall out of the ring. Bam, bam, attacked Goldberg for the DQ, and that was that. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. <laughs> the only good thing about it is Goldberg's music hit, and the crowd woke up. The crowd was going ape during this two and a half minute match but there wasn't anything to it I wrote complete shit so apparently I didn't think it was that great it wasn't that great I'm not I'm not saying watching it on TV I'm saying the crowd was they couldn't even let Goldberg win his final match before losing to Kevin Nash no like you couldn't even they had to protect Scott Hall Scott Hall Jesus Christ this show sucks it's the worst show I've ever seen again the only redeeming thing on the show is Ric Flair and Eric Bischoff Mm mm-hmm so I do have the list of finishes. Oh, I yes. won't. I won't lie. It's boring this week. But I guess tradition holds that until these shows are both good and both logically booked at the same time, we will continue to list the finishes on each show for comparison's sake. The finishes on this show were clean pin, clean pin, clean pin, pin after a ref bump and botched interference. Clean submission. DQ due to run in in 30 seconds. Clean pin. Submission after the guy who was going to lose anyway got distracted by his own tag team partner. Clean submission. Clean pin. And then finally, DQ due to run in in two minutes. Thank you for the loud sneeze in the middle of that. I apologize. I tried to do it off mic, but it didn't work. There you go, everybody. WCW Monday Nitro 171, December 20... That's the wrong one. 172. Hey, are you you aware of what day this was? The day after... Starcade. Starcade. The day after the streak ended. What happened at Starcade? Lots of stuff. What was the big thing that happened at Starcade? The biggest thing that happened at Starcade, according to this show, was uh, Eric Bischoff beating Ric Flair. Yeah. But there's also a new world champion. Casually mentioned, oh, by the way, the streak is over and there's a new world champion. And by the end of this show, that whole thing about Ric Flair and Eric Bischoff, it didn't matter. Listen, I'll say one thing, okay? The payoff at the end of this show was awesome. Yes. Okay? So, given that that was the payoff at the end, they should have been building up throughout the show that Eric Bischoff had beaten Ric Flair at Starcade. Okay? I'm fine with that. But you're opening up the show, and the big story is not that Goldberg's streak was broken after 173 straight wins, and Kevin Nash is the champion? Are you kidding me? Goldberg never appeared on this show. Nope. Oh, you got shot with a cattle prod. He could be dead. I suppose so. So, correcting myself from earlier, this is Nitro 172, December 28th, 1998. So, they opened with clips of Eric Bischoff in the limo after Starcade, and Bagwell's in there, and Scott Steiner and Kurt Hennig, and they're all celebrating the big win over Ric Flair. They go to the announcers, and Mike Tanay calls Starcade, and I quote, a historic and disappointing night. <laughs> <laughs> In hindsight, that's even more true. And he's right. Yeah. Talk about Bischoff and Bischoff and Bischoff and Bischoff. And oh, by the way, Goldberg streak is over and Kevin Nash is world champion. Let's talk about Eric Bischoff some more. And then we got a Bischoff and Power video package. The same one. Yep. It wasn't even a new one. They just replayed the same one from last week. Five more minutes, minutes of Eric Bischoff. Minutes on end. This just kept going. Go to commercial. Clips of the Nitro Party that won the contest for best party. Excuse me, hold on a second. So Starcade happened, mm-hmm. and then they opened with Eric Bischoff talk, mm-hmm. and then a Bischoff video package. Yes. 
And then they went to Nitro party footage? Yep. That's what happened. Okay, just yeah. check. Yeah. Because that seems pretty stupid. Kinda. They had cookies and they had hot dogs and they threw a guy in a pool. What's next? Shat? No, the cat. Well, it was the shat. He came out next. Twelve minutes in and he is out there for a promo. At this point, they very casually mentioned, not only is Goldberg streak over and he's no longer the world champion, Scott Hall used a taser on him to subdue him and give Kevin Nash the a title. A cattle prod. Cattle prod. Stun gun. They used all sorts of terms right. throughout the show. I don't think they knew what he got him with. They even got an expert on later on. They did. Oh, oh well, that guy. Oh, we'll get to him. So, Cat calls all the fans ugly, says he wants to whip somebody tonight, and Chris Jericho and Ralphus appear with Shima, making his Nitro debut. He's acting very, very shy. Jericho saying, no, no, you can fight this guy. He's making fun of his the last name, Nabunaga, I believe it was. Yeah. Nabunaga. Or this Jericho called him Nabunaga Ding Dong and all that stuff. So, anyway, Cat versus Shima. Cat destroyed him one, one with a kick. The great Shima was put away in less than 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was bullshit. Yeah. This show's really bad so far. <laughs> it's a terrible show. It's only begun. Speaking of terrible... We got still shots of the Nash Goldberg match, including Kevin Nash using a cross arm breaker. When mm -hmm. I saw when I saw Nash putting <laughs> a straight arm bar on Goldberg <laughs> at Starcade, that was awesome. What? what are you talking about? That's one word for it. I almost wanted to go back and watch the match. I do too, actually. That's this was not Goldberg no. putting an arm bar on Nash. This was Nash putting an arm bar on Goldberg. Now, I didn't go back and see it, but in the Observer, the way that Dave described it, he said that Goldberg was mounted on Nash doing ground and pound, and Nash switched that into an armbar. What? That sounds literally impossible. It is impossible. That's why now I want to see this match. I, think, I believe Kevin Nash would have to, like a vampire, turn into a cloud of smoke for that to occur. Well, he did something. Norman Smiley versus Chavo Guerrero Jr., well, first off, we had clips of Ric Flair collapsing. For those of you that forgot that a few weeks ago he had a heart attack, they claimed, on Nitro, they reminded us with footage from clutching his shoulder. Norman Smiley and Chavo Guerrero did 10 minutes of comedy about dancing and the hobby horse. Larry debuted, I believe, the first time the term Big Wiggle. He did. did he named this move. Yeah. They were, the announcers were laughing at him. And then well, it stuck. It stuck. Hey, did you know, by the way, that Starcade was the night before and Goldberg lost the title? Seems, seems and they relevant. followed that up with Shima versus Ernest Miller uh -huh. and then Norman Smiley versus Chavo Guerrero. They just move as on and nothing happened. Horrible as this was, the announcers are fiddling as Rome Burns, laughing about the big wiggle. They don't give a shit about anything. And that's bad enough, but in this match itself... Chavo's getting beaten on, and he's getting beaten on, and he's selling, and finally, Norman Smiley gets a hold of his hobby horse. That's not a euphemism, by the way. He grabs a hold of his hobby horse, and he starts pretending to ride it. Look at Tony's face. He's puzzled. And this, this is what causes Chavo to fire up and make his big comeback. Fuck this show. Keep your hands off my horse, man. Norman won with the crossface chicken wing. This was atrocious. This was not good wrestling. At home with Raven. Also not good. Oh, I don't know. Oh, no, dude. This was one of the best <laughs> things on the show. This reminded me too I much of home, so actually. I could so have played Raven. I just watched this whole thing. This was right up my alley. So, Canyon, Raven, and Mama Raven pull up in a Rolls Royce in front of a big giant house. Canyon's apparently never been there before. Blown away by everything he sees. Raven's still wearing... Jean Another poor wrestler. Well, yeah. <laughs> I've never seen a big house. <laughs> Raven's still wearing jean shorts and a sleeveless t-shirt. He doesn't want to talk to anyone. Doesn't want to I like do his anything. No he's, got his, no, he's got his leather vest on. No. He had his t-shirt on. No, he had his leather vest because his mom said, will you take off your jacket? And he goes, I like my jacket, mom. <laughs> and I remember that because I thought Raven hates everything, but he likes his jacket. Like, this jacket means a lot to him. Well, all I know is he was pouting and acting very... Surly, and he took off his jacket. As he did said, when he got in the house. Yes, and it's, he was wearing a suicidal tendencies T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the first thing he does is he goes to his mom's bar. He goes to pour yeah. a drink, and he goes, "Canyon, pour me a drink." Canyon's like, "No." And he says, "Canyon, pour me a drink." 
Kenyon says no. And his mom goes, no, you're not drinking, Scotty. So then Scotty walks to the couch and he goes, fine, can I have a club soda? This was so amazing. Then he picks, and this is the first one. And then he picks up the remote control and can't figure it out. Mom, turn on the TV. The TV's not working. This is the best. And she yells back, try the remote. I tried the remote, try, Mom. Try the remote. What did you think he was doing? Well, you know, manually I guess. turning knobs. I suppose so. I loved this. I don't want to hear anything bad about this, okay. Craig. I will not allow it. It seems silly, that's all. It was silly. It seems The, the si- show sucks. It seems silly, you say. <laughs> so something entertaining right. is a positive. <laughs> you thought that you were going for... Oh, never mind. Booker T versus Fit Finley. Fitty, basic, good TV match. Nothing special. Announcers were talking about Starky the entire time. Finley went up top. Booker slammed him down. Had a leaping sidekick and a missile dropkick for the win. I do have to say this, that these fans... The one thing about WCW is no matter how bad the booking was, they still drew wrestling fans to come to the shows. Sure. And so if you had two guys that they saw even remotely as stars having a wrestling match, they would cheer the finish. That's what happened here. They popped big when Booker T hit that missile drop kick and won. It made me happy to think that there was still hope. <laughs> even though there wasn't. We know, we know there's no hope. Me and Gene called out Ric Flair. So the story is, Flair, after his loss last night, had gone to the airport and got an on the airplane to fly home, and then changed his mind and decided he must come to the building in Baltimore to fight Eric Bischoff. You know, I was at Cannon Beach about a year ago. I was on the ride back, four and a half hours, and I was like, I gotta listen to something. So, Maiden, I found on YouTube, Ric Flair's greatest crazy promos or something. <laughs> It was like an hour or two hours long or something like that. I started playing it, listening to Flair just being out of his mind. This promo was on there, and I must have loved it because I knew this promo word for word when I watched it here tonight. It was even better because I saw it with the video. Like, I only heard the audio the first time. This promo was so great. Mm -hmm. So Flair comes out. He's in street clothes. He's all bandaged up. He's got his luggage with him. He had enough baggage to supply a large convoy to the peak of Mount Everest. Yes. <laughs> well, he's got all of his clothes. He needed a Sherpa to carry his luggage. Yes. He's got to dress up on the way to the building. He's got to, I'm sure, have another suit for in the ring. His airplane suit. He's got to have another suit because invariably he's going to throw his shoes into the crowd. So gotta, he's got to have another suit to go out afterwards. Got to have those robes. And then, of course, he's going to lose half his clothes that night. And so he's got to have another outfit for the next morning. This made perfect sense to me. Hmm. Plus gifts for all his women. When you have that Yeah. Hand, yeah. So Flair said yes, he got his ass kicked last night. He was ashamed of it. And everyone told him it was over. It was time to go home. And he got on the plane. He realized, realized, no, it's not over. I need to go to Baltimore. I need to go to Nitro. At this point, he began to disrobe. Takes his pants off. Says, this alligator belt, this Rolex. $30,000 Rolex. He throws it on the mat. These are yours, Eric Bischoff. He pulls out $100 bills, tears them in half, says, these are yours. Throws his shoes into the crowd. Strips to his boxers and screams he's not leaving Baltimore until he and Bischoff get something straight. He offers to leave wrestling forever and sign everything he owns. Everything he owns. House, cars, money. Debt. Over to Eric Bischoff. If uh, if Bischoff would fight him tonight. However, if Flair could beat Bischoff, then he would run WCW for 90 days. He handcuffed himself to the ropes and promised, if you go to commercial, when you come back, I'm going to be nude. They went to commercial. And I said, oh no. <laughs> Thankfully, he was bluffing. So Bischoff comes out. He says Flair was nuts. He's going to have a heart attack. Flair said, if I have a heart attack, it's going to be on your girlfriend. I went back and forth a bit. You're the worst Ric Flair, by the way. No shit. God damn, he was so good. (laughs) This promo was so amazing. Let me write that down. Vinny cannot deliver a promo. Oh my God, come on. All kinds of things, not as well as Ric Flair. Come on now. So... Eventually, Bischoff accepted Flair's challenge. This this one you can probably do. Bischoff's promo. I probably could. He had nothing to say, and it was very boring. Yeah. Did I even get to the part where Flair handcuffed himself to the ropes? Yes, you did. Okay. So that's the whole deal. Like, he handcuffs himself to the ropes, and Bischoff came out. It was actually smart, because you could have the two guys in the ring together, and it would make sense that Flair, Flair can't get to him. Yeah. That's right, exactly. and you still wanted to see it. As great as the first half with Flair was, Eric came out, and it took him so long to just say yes that they lost the crowd, which is... 
pretty impressive given how into this the crowd was before Eric Bischoff came out. Rick Flair, Flair was awesome. Rick Flair losing his mind and trying to get at Bischoff. I don't know where he put the key to the handcuffs, but it was they were restraining him from killing Eric. I Bischoff. don't know if he had a key. His plan backfired. Yeah. Just had handcuffs. This is Rick Flair. He doesn't think these things through. Oh, yeah, as I've, it's true. He just acts. As I've stated, Ric Flair is a ready fire aim kind of guy. Yes. Barry Windham versus Prince Iakea. You kidding me? This actually happened. God, this show's terrible. Crowd's dead. Match is boring. They followed Ric Flair taking his clothes off and throwing his shoes into the crowd with Barry Windham versus Prince Iakea. It wasn't very good. It yeah, sucked. It was a very short squash match. The big man beat the little man and won. I had completely forgotten. I, I realized I knew Barry Windham had done some stuff on Nitro. I had forgotten he was a regular for several weeks. Well, like two weeks ago, Rick well, he Flair, was till he becomes that tag team. Ric Flair beat him up two weeks ago and sent him packing because Bischoff brought him in to beat up Flair. Yes. They recapped Nash Goldberg again and showed Scott Hall teasing Goldberg. Me and Gene then interviewed a member of security. This is amazing. Can I can I take this over here? Why don't you? <laughs> Gene Okerlund has the opportunity. To interview a SWAT team sergeant. Right. Because last night, Goldberg was zapped with some weapon. It may be a cattle prod. It may be a taser. We don't know. I was a little un- unclear. Was he a security guard and a member of the SWAT team? He was He was a well, they, SWAT team sergeant. Yes, but he was also wearing a security yes. exactly. uh, polo. Yes. So, yeah. so Gene has the opportunity to interview this man. This man says... This this here cattle prod, mm-hmm. it's very powerful. Right. And it can do a lot of damage. And Gene says, well, if it'll drop a 2,000-pound Brahma bull, what might it do to a human? And he says, oddly nothing at all. You could short-circuit a person's nervous system and do serious damage. Gene then says, could this cattle prod be the reason that Goldberg is no longer the champion? This man says yes. Yeah, call it a hunch. And that's it. That was the whole interview. You forgot the part where he says, "Can you demonstrate how this taser works?" Oh yeah, he shoots it, and he just holds it up and he goes click 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 click, and he says, "Oh, that's enough." <laughs> From the sound alone, he could tell how dangerous this was. This is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Were tasers new in 1998? Well, hey, listen. At least they made a big deal out of the fact that Goldberg got tasered, and they were telling you, the viewer, That's how true. dangerous this That's was. True. That's true. But it was just, my point is, what a stupid interview. Yes. Okay, you can interview a guy about a taser. Mm-hmm. Come up with some questions. Okay, what could it do? Is it dangerous? Mm-hmm. Could it have beaten Goldberg? That's your fucking question? Interview over. How about, how much could it kill a man? Mm-hmm. That's important, right? Sure. Will Goldberg ever come back? Will he come back? Sure. Is he electrified forever? Is he hospitalized right now? Could he be in critical condition? Did you, this scramble his How brain? about, instead of interviewing some fucker about a cattle prod, you interview Goldberg's doctor? Yeah. Did Goldberg suffer the permanent damage to his nervous system you say can happen with these things? Did Goldberg soil himself? I mean, that is a good question. I'm glad it wasn't asked. But these are all better questions than Gene came up with here. The great Gene Okerlund. Had a commercial for WCW NWO Revenge, one of the all-time great pro wrestling video games. Probably the best. Well, the the, the No Mercy and WrestleMania 2000 games that okay. piggybacked on it were better. But this is the best WCW game for sure. And then me and Gene interviewed DDP. DDP called it a stun stick. Yeah. He talked about his win over the Giant for like 30 seconds and then moved on to hyping up Flair and Bischoff for like two minutes. I always love it when a Actually, before he did that, like right before he starts talking about Flair, he just throws out one line. Nash, you should do the right thing. And then he just moves on. Well, what would that be? I don't know. Give the guy the belt back? Yes. Give him a rematch? It's an important detail. So I always love it when a grown man, a professional combatant, is given a microphone... And he won't let himself say the word ass. Oh, yeah. We Eric Bischoff, today. Ric Flair is going to kick your... And he holds the mic out. Hey, I loved in Flair's promo where he's so angry. He's he's thrown his $30,000 Rolex down into the ring. 
He's offering to sign away his house to Eric Bischoff and everything that he owns. He's stripping down to his underwear and is threatening to strip himself completely naked. And Bischoff finally comes out and Flair says, and I quote, I can't swear, can I? <laughs> I missed that part. That's what he said. I need to go back and check. And Eric says, no, you can't. <laughs> it's like, you just fucking killed the angle right here, you two idiots. <laughs> I can't swear. Really? That's what he said. I need to go back and watch this. Yeah. I'll show you my schwanz, but I'm not going to curse. Conan was telling Disco Inferno to take his Wolfpack t-shirt off backstage. Nash walks up. Wait a second. Excuse me. Nash walks up? Kevin yeah. Nash, the new You're telling champion. me the first appearance of Kevin Nash after ending Goldberg's streak is a segment with Disco Inferno? <laughs> yep. And Conan. Uh, he walks up. That seems fucking stupid. He walks up in jeans and a hockey jersey. Just a regular guy, except a little taller than normal. No indication he is the new champion of the world and the biggest star in the sport. He cuts a rambling promo. He's upset. He's upset, you see. Because Disco Inferno stuck his nose into the match. Now there's a black cloud hanging over Kevin Nash's title. Oh, no. It's all Disco's fault. He's disappointed in being champion In this company. Do you notice he had a booking sheet? There wasn't a clean finish. He did, in fact, have that. (laughs) And then he says, I'll tell you what. I will get you booked at a match. And if you win, fine. We'll put you in the wolf pack. You can prove yourself. So Nash, on camera, is a booker now. They did later say he went to the WCW committee and got the match booked with his influence as world champion. whoop de doo Picks of Hooventud, Ray, and Kidman in Starcade, which Tony Schiavone called the best triangle match in WCW history. Hmm. Had- so if you didn't watch Starcade, they they really tried hard to make Kidman a star. He like won two big matches. They pushed him hard. So they come out here. It's Ray and Kidman versus Hoovy and Eddie Guerrero. Okay. If you didn't watch Starcade, was there any indication whatsoever that they tried to make Kidman a star the night before? No. How about the finish? The the crowd did pop for him bigger than anybody else. Uh, the finish was uh, after everything in the world fell apart, Eddie said, fuck this, and he pinned Kidman with a frog splash. That is what happened. Mm-hmm. Vinny, I should make you watch the opener on Raw this week. If you think this fell apart, John Cena and the Drifter. That sounds terrible. John Cena's first match, his first singles match since the Roman Reigns match, like two and a half months ago, three months ago. They went 16 fucking minutes. Oh, dear. Yes, they did. And during the near falls at the end, they got a this is boring chant, to which John Cena immediately just took it home. It was... (laughs) This match was horrible. I don't blame him. Oh, my God. Now, this match here... So, they explain three of the four guys are in the LWO. Ray doesn't want to be. But he is. Hoovy and Eddie are in there. Yeah. And Kidman's a white guy. So he's Disqualified, yeah. Yes. So, they have this fucking match where, like, guys aren't getting along with each other. They're trying to have a great match, but still do the stupid storyline that WCW wants, built around something nobody cares about, the LWO. They have a couple of great high spots. And then, at the end of this match, everybody's in everybody else's way. Uh Hoovy's trying to hit the ropes to do a dive, and Eddie's standing right in the middle of the ring. And the ref. Hoovy shoves Eddie out of the way to run and do the dive anyway. This was a mess. Mm -hmm. So, Kidman's on... First of all, all four guys have been in the ring for like five minutes, and they're, they're they're all staring at each other, trying to figure out who needs to be in what position. Kidman goes up top. Ray charges at Eddie. Eddie throws him over his head. Ray and Kidman go bonk. Kidman goes to the floor. Ray goes to the mat. The action stops. And Eddie just grabs Ray and throws him out. Just just leave. Just get out of this ring right now. By the way, we were 15 minutes in by this point. It had been a very bad 15 minutes. This is not a good match that fell apart at the end. This is a match that started off cra- crappy and stayed that way. So yes, finally in the end, Eddie just pinned Kidman with a frog splash. I missed anything in this? No. It went on for a no, long time. It's very, very long. It was not terrible, but it was a mess. Mm-hmm. The Wolfpack came out for a promo. Now, earlier, Kevin Nash appeared in his jeans and hockey shirt. He comes out here in jeans and hockey shirt again, and I started to write that they didn't even bring the belt with him. And then realized I realized he had, and it was so such a minor part of the whole deal, this... The physical representation of his status as world champion 
was like a, the third afterthought behind Lex and Conan. Yeah. He cuts this rambling promo. Oh, my God. He's supposed to be a baby face. <laughs> this. Right. This was an argument for scripted promos, and I hate scripted promos. Everybody boos. They're chanting Goldberg. His fucking victory speech after ending Goldberg's streak, he makes sure to bring up Disco Inferno and the Wolf Pack. Yeah. He says, coming up in this business, he thought wrestling was about three things, money, power, and respect. He did? That's what he said. And he said, I've got enough money, and the world champion always has power. I'm thinking, okay, here goes the respect line. Then he shifted gears. <laughs> he just jumped the tracks and started talking about uh, Disco and Bam Bam. Point number four. He booked Disco versus Bam Bam Bigelow. And if Disco won, he'd be in the wolf pack. And he gets back on track. He says, yes, I respect Goldberg. I want to give him a rematch for the belt next week in Atlanta. I still think I can kick your ass. And he said it. DDP he did not. He yeah. said ass. Yeah. He's going to be in trouble. You know, it's one of those things where I know exactly what's happening next week. But when he said, I'm going to give you a rematch January 4th in Atlanta. <laughs> right. I was like, God. Run. Dude. <laughs> it's all run screaming from the show. So we got Disco Inferno versus Bam Bam Bigelow. Am I the only one who thought this was one of my favorite things on the show? Oh, the yeah. The finish was amazing. I love this match. This match was so much I mean, fun. Watching Bam Bam beat up Disco was great. Disco made a comeback Disco and the place goes back. Mm -hmm. Bam Bam sold for everything. <laughs> Disco hit the stunner. Bam Bam kicked out easily. And then Bam Bam Bigelow grabbed him. <laughs> hit. Now. Well, hold on. Before he, we even talk about hitting it. He goes to lift Disco. Yes. And Disco, like, wasn't quite ready to go up. Timing was not there. But Bigelow just hurt well, him up what, onto his shoulder. That's what I'm getting into. Yes. Bam Bam called his finisher the, uh, he called it the Greenies from Asbury Park. Right. Yes. It was an over-the-shoulder pile driver, very similar to what Rikishi used to do. Yes, exactly. It was to a similar physique, which is why he could do it. It was cooler it. looking, though. <laughs> this one was. Yes. He grabs Disco Inferno, a big human being, with one arm, and he's holding Disco in front of him. Not on top of him, in front of him, with one arm, upside down, with Disco's feet sticking straight up in the air. Mm -hmm. But it was the lift. Yeah. Like... What was the lift and the hold? There's a lot of fat guys yeah. who you know are really powerful, but like... The queen and the jerk. I never looked at Bam Bam Bigelow and thought, you know, there's a real powerful, strong man underneath mm -hmm. all that fat. Yeah. He lifted this guy up. Scott Steiner cowered in fear backstage at this man's power. <laughs> Do not attempt this with Paisley. You won't pull it off. No, and then Disco is literally completely straight upside down. Yeah, his like, legs pointing straight up in the air. It's ridiculous. Like, like it's totally dart. fake, but it was totally awesome. Yeah. Because you're thinking, this man's about to get spiked right on his noggin. So he goes to drop him. He goes to sit down and drop him on his head. And I, think, I figure, okay, this is the part where Bam Bam brings his other arm over for more control and more... Hell no. Nope. <laughs> Bam Bam sat down on his ass. He dropped Disco on his head, but with one arm, he protected him and it was totally safe. This was fucking unreal. Yep. I watched this like five times. It's it's right up there with Scott Steiner doing this this square driver. It's close, actually. Yeah. This is better. <laughs> this is great. It was insanely great. Kurt Hedding is helping Bischoff warm up backstage. Oh, my God. Flair's fucking doctor. Was this out of Memphis Wrestling or is it just yes. me? Yes. Dude, totally. no way. Memphis Wrestling would have been entertaining. <laughs> they go to a video of Flair's they, doctor. They say, here we go, live from Charlotte. It's Ric Flair's doctor. And as soon as he appears on screen, you're like, not only was this pre-taped, like, hours ago, this may have been pre-taped 20 years ago. <laughs> he's blurry. He's out of focus. We're to, we're to believe that on a live show, they got a cameraman to a doctor's office states away. I'm going I'm to try and recreate what happened. This is Baltimore. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do a poor Four job. Right away. Yeah. Because even attempting to, I could not possibly have as little charisma as this man. He basically says, this is not exactly what he said. I'm just reading from mm. WebMD. A heart attack is a medical emergency. A heart attack usually occurs when a blood clot blocks blood flow to the heart. Without blood, tissue loses oxygen and dies. Hmm. Symptoms include tightness or pain in the chest, neck, back, or arms as well as fatigue, lightheadedness, abnormal heartbeat, and anxiety. Women are more likely to have atypical symptoms than men. Your, 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 your Treatment ranges settle, settle. from life side changes. Bring it down I'm notch. just trying to keep moving here. Just bring it down a notch. This guy went on and on and on. And he never got excited. And on 
You and never on, see a doctor so bored by heart attack. That's not even the key. Did he have to tell me about this for 10 minutes? Yes. By the third time I heard myocardial infraction. No, no. I was ready to have a heart attack. I liked mild cardiac infarction. <laughs> That's what it is, though. <laughs> yes, I fucked it up. He's the doctor. <laughs> That's the actual term. Had some of those. But what the hell do I need to hear about that on Nitro for? Just tell me. We think Ric Flair got poisoned. The upshot of this was the doc- upshot. <laughs> the storyline's stupid. You're right. That's the wrong word. The end result of this was the doctor says Ric Flair was poisoned. And then it's so fucked up, okay? Because the doctor, I think, is trying to explain that somebody poisoned Ric Flair, right? Yes. Then they go back to the announcers, and the announcers get into an argument because... Not even an argument. They believe... they they What they got out of this, okay, <laughs> is that Flair had poison in his system. Right. And so they can't figure out... Well, I mean, was he poisoned? Or could he get poison in his system some other there, way? There was a toxic, uh, toxin a toxin. in his system. Yeah. Yeah. Toxin, yeah. Is there any other way to get a toxin in your system he than does, to be poisoned? He does drink a lot. Then, later, they go to Gene Oakland interviewing Eric, and Gene goes, looks like Ric Flair had food poisoning. I'm like, food poison? That's totally fucking different. You guys can't get your fucking story straight. No. I just like, the doctor does his eight-minute monologue about the heart attack symptoms, and they go back to the announce desk, and... You've never seen three more gobsmacked announcers in your life. Mm-hmm. Just slack jawed, staring at the camera, barely, yeah. barely speaking above a whisper, whisper. Like this is the most shocking thing you can imagine. The 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 possibility that somebody may have slipped Ric Flair a Mickey. Someone may have poisoned Vinny, him. This is more than a Mickey. Mm-hmm. An infarction almost occurred. <laughs> yeah. This is serious toxins we're talking about here. Fine, except. This is the same show where guys hit each other in the head with steel chairs all the time, and 24 hours ago, the world title changed hands due to a taser attack. You know, now that I think about it, when that guy was talking about the taser, something should be done about this. That's a pretty serious (laughs) attack. (laughs) And it involves the World Heavyweight Championship. Yeah. Well, fuck that, Vinny. Someone's life. I do. (laughs) Gene goes to interview Bischoff, who says the word quack 47 times. Denies doing anything wrong. And he calls him a cow doctor, or like a pig doctor a pig, or something. All, all sorts of but animals. But he's also a quack. The whole damn barnyard got This in was there. like old McDonald. Scott Steiner versus Conan. Conan is doing his spiel. Buff Bagwell steals the mic to interrupt, but that's, it was all part of Conan's plan. Because as Buff and Scott are flapping their mouths, Conan beats up Scott Steiner's special referee. And out comes Scott Dickinson volunteering oh, God. to be a referee in his place. Another bullshit referee storyline. Mm-hmm. How many of those do we need? Like, every month they got a new one. So Steiner beat up Conan. It was very boring, but I will say this. <laughs> I know where you're going. To his credit, because it was so boring, Conan still had gas in his tank left. He could actually make a real comeback this week. No. No. Well, I mean, he made a good comeback, but the whole key was it didn't matter how blown up he got. Steiner just hoisted him up and put him wherever yes, he needed him. That's also true. The, listen, here's the setup for the comeback. Steiner lifts him up, but then falls down with him on top of yes. it. Yes. Did, Conan didn't have to do anything. No. No. Uh, you only had to make a quick comeback. Made his comeback, got through it all, hooks the tequila sunrise, but then no, nothing can ever be that simple. Bagwell interferes. Oh, compared to Rod, this was simple. <laughs> like Luger's out there. It was too convoluted to write down, but Buff and Conan somehow fell out of the ring together. And Steiner got Conan back in the ring, hooked the Steiner recliner for the win. He is the new TV champion. So there were a lot of people before Starcade that were lobbying for Steiner to beat Goldberg. Steiner would be the man who ended the streak. I could buy that. He'd be top heel, another crazy fucker, and he'd be the champion. But instead they go with Nash, and I guess as a make-do, they made Steiner the TV champion. By the way, which is still fine. Buff Bagwell having to save Rick Steiner from a submission hold. I didn't buy that. I bet you Steiner could have got out of that. Scott I'm Steiner. just saying. Where's Rick? I'm sorry. We'll never know if he could have gotten out of that. Hold the other right Steiner, Rick Rex Steiner. It's his real name. That's the right. Robert Steiner. Robert, damn it. Rex is his middle name. We went over this. Tried a comedy call back and fucked it up. Scott Hall versus Brian Adams. Dude. Razor Ramon and fucking Crush. This was <laughs> inconceivably bad. Dude. Okay. Hall Before, may as well have been drunk. That's how bad this was. Before things even get started. Let's oh, just, yeah. Let's just establish 
what's going on and who these characters are. The biggest star in the sport up till about 24 hours ago was Bill Goldberg. Mm-hmm. Scott Hall cheated to screw Bill Goldberg out of the world championship. And what was his motive? To help his friend, Kevin Nash. Even though they're on opposite teams. So, fans like Goldberg, hate Hall, indifferent towards Nash, who was kind of a victim at this point. But then Hall, after screwing Bill Goldberg to help his friend, Kevin Nash, says, I am not friends with Kevin Nash. Right? Right. Okay. Out comes Brian Adams from the NWO. Okay, I, I, think, I think you got it all right. I, I tried to condense it, so... Hall cut a heel promo on Nash. Yeah. Yes. Who people hate, but is supposed to be a baby face. Yes. Plus, he fucked over Goldberg with a cattle prod. This is Hall, not Nash. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then he worked as a baby face in the match. Right. Correct. <laughs> yes. Against the second worst NWO member. You know, this place went out of business. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> so, Brian Adams comes out there. Everyone hates Hall. Everyone hates Brian Adams. Hall was no, it was a good wrestler. Adams was not. They're doing this match. No one gives a shit. Gee, I wonder why. I know I'm it's hard to believe. A bear hug followed by a nerve hold. Dude, okay, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, the, the, the wrestling was uh, making the worst of a bad situation. But this could have been Angle and Benoit, their primes. The crowd still would have shat on it. So, it's a terrible Curtis match. Miller? Yeah. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible match. I'm trying to figure out, like, who's on whose side. Why? Why were you wasting your damn time? Vinny's got a point. Who's on whose side? Who gives a shit? Well, you're right. This match was a waste of my life. Tony Schiavone, what's his reputation as an announcer? Fair, now fair, or... Or, fair or unfair, when people think of Tony Schiavone, what do they think of? Well, it depends. Well, let's go with over-the-top hyperbole. Okay. Okay. So the, he, earlier, he said that Star K 3-way was the best triangle match in the history okay, of he was Okay, he was prone to hyperbole. He would say things like, the greatest moment of, in the history of our sport sure. about a non-title match with a run and finish. Things like that. He also calls a full arm dragon a twist, but there's no such thing. Go ahead. So, Brian Adams... What does that have to do with anything? I don't know. It just bothers me. (laughs) Brian Adams goes to this pile driver, which we have all noted is a terrible, terrible move. His execution is awful. And dangerous. And dangerous. And he does this move, and Tony Schiavone says, that was almost a pile driver. Almost a pile driver. Vinny. He's right. I know. For yes. once in his life. I know. Is actually. But, okay, but, I see but, your point. The point is, when Tony Schiavone, of all people, is worried about maintaining credibility when calling your moves, you suck. So this match was awful. Then there was a bear hug. Then there was a nerve pinch. Then there was a chant for Razor. And Adams hits a press slam. He goes to the middle rope for the second time. And Hall hits the edge and wins. Thank God it's over. <sighs> The only good thing on the show was the main event segment. This was great. Yeah. Ric Flair versus Eric Bischoff. First of all, I did not write down Buffer's uh, promo word for word, but talked about Ric Flair sacrificing all of his wealth. <laughs> all of his riches. All of his wealth. Mm-hmm. All of his possessions down to the clothes on his back. That was awesome. So Flair comes out. They cut to the back where Bischoff is refusing to wrestle. He's going to the parking lot going to his limo, going to leave. When he opens the door, the horsemen are waiting in the limo, and they jump out and carry him down to the ring. Physically yeah. carried him. So they carry him out there. They go to the break. When they come back, now Bishop's in the ring. Flair just starts beating the hell out of him. NWOB teamers run down the aisle to make the save, but the horsemen are there to whip their ass. Now, what's funny, if you're paying attention, there's three other horsemen. Four, if you count Arn, who ran out later. There's five or six B teamers. So everyone pairs off, but this guy's left over. So Kurt Hennig runs out to make the save. He weaves his way through traffic, and he realizes, wait, there's no one between me and the ring now. He turns around and goes back to brawl with the horseman. Yes. So I want to mention, by the way, that Macho Man Randy Savage, if you ever watched him in WWF, he looked looked a certain way. Sure. Have you ever watched him in Spider-Man? Mm-hmm. Yes. He looked a different way. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So we were watching these nitros, and like all through 95, 96, I'm like, Macho still looks like WWF. Yep. Macho Man. Yeah, absolutely. When does he blow up and look all weird? We found out. Fucking today. All right, now. This was the debut. Mm -hmm. Walks down the aisle with gorgeous George. Yes. He's got new hair. Mm -hmm. He's got a new body. 
He literally now looks like a cartoon He's character. Got two new, new, new bodies because you see Gorgeous George. Well, it's not the man entirely, but yes. his transformation was like China's when she came back. She went from like all big jawed and burly and then came back and had a new face and a new body. That's exactly what happened to Savage here. Yeah. He could barely move. And that's, that's another thing. He, he, as he is walking down the aisle, guys are passing him. Arn Anderson, a retired, a retired guy, runs by him. The giant, who is big and fat, runs by him. The giant hits the ring, starts beating up Flair. Savage is the ring. He plays nice with Giant, but then low blows him from behind, clotheslines him out of the ring. He leaves. Taking off his NWO shirt. Tears off his NWO shirt. And Flair suplexes Bischoff. He styles and profiles. He hooks the figure four. Place, when he hit that suplex, mm -hmm. like, there were so many fans that remembered that used to be his finish. Yeah. And they went nuts. And he starts dancing, and he goes for the figure four. They're on their feet. They're screaming. They're going crazy. Bischoff taps. This was awesome. And then everybody comes out. You got Tony Schiavone saying, I got to go be there for this. Tony Schiavone leaves the announce desk. Mm -hmm. Larry is in the ring. Dusty's in the ring. They're all celebrating with Booker Flair. T, DDP. All the baby faces. Flair drops an elbow, pins Eric again. The place is going nuts. Like, this was... You know what this was? This was a great ending to 1998. Yeah. In WCW. When you look at, like, everything that went down this year, everything that went down with Eric Bischoff and Ric Flair, and you think about, God, the storyline they did with Eric and Rick, and Eric beats the guy at Starcade. Are they out of their minds? But they did this the next night. Way more people saw this than saw Starcade. This was a way bigger deal. They, they totally put over Flair. Eric just laid down the biggest humiliation he could possibly endure, aside from having his head shaved. And then next week, it's 99. I loved At it. least we got this moment. As Flair put him back in the figure four as the show's closing, Heenan yells, I wonder if I can hit up Flair for a raise. Yes. Because he's always Bobby Heenan. Love him. All right. Do we need to do a finishes on this show? They weren't that exciting. We do. We do. It's a new tradition, but right. Not to mention, can I just Actually, say one it, more time it, how awesome the ending of this show was? That too. But it's also important for the contrast of when we do this when we raw, with a Raw segment. Oh, yeah. There is a strong contrast. All right, are you ready? Ready, boss. Where the fuck's the music? The finishes on this show were clean pin and a squash. Clean submission after assorted hobby horse-related tomfoolery. Clean pin. Clean pin. Clean pin in a horrible tag match. Clean pin! That's a lot of clean pins so far. I told you it was kind of unnecessary. Submission win after interference by two dudes. One for each guy. A clean pin. Finally in the main event. Submission win after interference by dozens of men and the return of a major star. <laughs> 